Morning, sir. My name is Obaro, sir. sir. My you are. How are you, sir? You your name. It's fine, thank you. It's fine, thank you. No, I'm looking for Chief Goody, Dr. Chief Goody Ibu. Um, Goody Ibu is here, but I think uh, we need to, um, he needs to unmute his mic so that we can uh, listen to him. Uh, Reverend Kanon Panga, can you hear me? Is uh, Reverend Kanon Baga there? No, I can't yes, see you speak in the demo there. Reverend, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, but uh, okay, your video is on now. I can see you now. So you are leading the opening prayer, so you need to be uh, fully ready. So I'm ha I'm happy I can see you. I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Barra. I can see you now. Uh, it's a it's a dark for you. So maybe, yeah, put on. Yeah, I can see you clearly now. right? Yes. Uh, where is um, our guest speaker, Mr. Peter Bankoli? Shay, did you talk to him uh, this morning? Big woman. Big woman. But for your grace, I could not be saved. But for your grace, I would go my way. Can you check your mail, please? I sent you my last night.
Dr. Bessie? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Will I be able to share my slides or I should just speak to it? Uh, I think you can speak to it. Um, All right. Yes. Dr. Okay. Benson, we're going to have open comments. Can you refer me from here to be a co host yes, as I've well? Yes, i the message. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing now. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Benstein. Um, I would like to share my slide when I'm making my presentation, please. Okay, I'll make you the co I'll make you a co-host. I'll do that now. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. I was actually looking out for you before. Thank God that you are here. You're welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you. I've been here for a while. I was just trying to know who the host is. Okay, so I've made this a completely new look. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. <laughs> I've made you co-host, uh, Mr. Bankoli. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also going to um, do a second screen. I like to do two screens, but that's not a problem. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, what a problem. I can't recognize you anymore. I know. This is my COVID look, so... <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you, have, you, have to get, you have to get used to it. 
Uh, I can't see Femi. Femi, are you are you in? Femi, he's I coming. Can't see are him. you in? He's not in yet. I can't see Femi, so I can't make him a co-host. Uh, so, Ejiro, are you there? Um, Aisha? I'm here. Okay, so look out for Femi and make him a co-host. Femi's not here. I'm here. I'm here. Let me check for Femi. So when he comes in, you can make him a co-host. Yeah. All right. Okay, I will. So uh, 1205 will be going live, 1205. So that's another two minutes. Um, and then we go live. So when we go live, we'll keep everyone muted and uh, the program starts officially. Once again, welcome everyone to the fourth uh, memorial lecture in the honor of uh, our icon and our legend, the late Olorogo Dr. Michael Christopher Evil. So one minute. Oh, one, 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 one. Good afternoon, Peter. Good afternoon, this man, uh, Rowani. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, wherever you are joining us from. I will welcome you to this memorial lecture of the Fort Olorogu Michael Christopher Ebru of blessed memory. Today, we'll be celebrating a legend, a man who touched the lives and destinies of so many people, so many community and nations all over the world. Would we'll also be having the official launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, the EIC, in his blessed honor. My name is Dr. Benson Uweru, and uh, I'll be your host and moderator for this program this afternoon. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has joined us and wherever you are joining us from. To start, I'd like to just measure to get a sense of how you feel today. So we'll start with the live poll to gauge your feeling. How are you feeling today? Just kindly respond with how you feel today. Great. Okay, we are seeing that people are making it coming. It's a one uh, sixty second poll. Okay. Thirty seconds to go. Tell us how you're feeling today. Okay, that's the end of the poll. And uh, I think we have everyone feeling excellent, which is good. 57% feeling excellent, 31% very good, 6% good, and uh, six people, they are thankful. No one is managing. I think that is a good thing in spite of the crisis that we all have to deal with, COVID-19 and the recent uh, uh, increase in uh, Year prices as well as tariffs for electricity. We thank God for life and we're thankful that you are all here and God bless you for joining us. We'll take a, a very quick music interlude just as we carry on with the program. Please watch. Oh boy. 
your grace I could not be saved But for your grace I would go my way I'm forever grateful that you have me Lord for your amazing but for your grace, I cannot be saved. But for your grace, I will go my way. I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Thank you. We'll take another quick poll, and this time we will be reflecting on the life. We'll be reflecting on the life of uh, the legend that we are celebrating today. I'd like you to tell us who the man we are celebrating today was to you. Who was Olorogo Michael Ebro to you? We know we have people joining us from all over the world. So let us know who he was to you. It's multiple choice. Thirty seconds more to go. Okay, the result shows that 69% uh, say he is a role model. So everyone here, at least 69% of us believe he was our role model. That's a good one. Uh, some said he's a leader, family, business partner, friend. Uh, and that's the life we are celebrating, a life that was well lived to the glory of God. Uh, and uh, we thank you all for joining us. Welcome once again to the fourth memorial lecture in the honor of Olorego Michael C.O. Ebru and the launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. Today, our keynote speaker is Mr. Peter Bamkole, who will be talking on innovation in entrepreneurship changes the rules of the game. Also, we have our distinguished chairman, Olorego Moses Tiger, the president general of the Urubo Progress Union, worldwide here in attendance with our special guest of honor. We will recognize them as we make progress. At this point, we'll take uh, the next uh, video. Let's watch. So rest in your embrace. 
thank you. We'll do another poll, but that will be much later in the program. Ladies and gentlemen, robos all over the world, and everyone participating in this memorial service, we welcome you specially. At this point, we would uh, like to share the agenda. After now, we'll take the national anthem, followed by the robo anthem, and then we will receive the opening prayer for today by Reverend Colonel Gabriel Banga. After that, I would introduce our special guests, and then we'll take the chairman's opening address by Honorable Dr. Moses Tiger, the President General of the Robo Progress Union Worldwide. Following that, we'll have the citation of the legend and icon we are celebrating today by none other than Mr. Goody M. Ebru O.O.N. And after that, we'll take a short clip on the life of Olorogo Michael Christopher Ebru. And then we'll take the keynote address from our keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Bamkole, the pioneer director of the Enterprise Development Center of the Pan-Atlantic University. Following his presentation of the first session of the questions and answers, after that, we would have the panelists introduced as well as a panel discussion. Following the panel discussion, we will take a short clip of the Enterprise Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, and then the launching of the center by our chief launcher, Olorogu Johnson Barowe, the managing director of the Westminster College. We are here with very distinguished senior citizens of our great country and participants from all over the world today. And we've received goodwill messages from all over the world. But for the purpose of time, we'll be focusing on the goodwill messages from His Excellency, the Deputy Senate President, Senator Ubi Omar Gege, as well as El Masha Sadiq Abubakar, the Chief of Air Staff, who is also here, Professor Gigi Dara of the Delta State University, and Mr. GT Okoloko, who is the GCEO, the Group Chief Executive Officer and MD of Notori Chemicals, PLC. And then a vote of thanks by the Vice Chancellor of the Michael Cecilia Hebrew University, Professor Ibinka Fuakbe. And then we'll have the closing prayer by Olorogu Edure Agba, the President of the Robo Social Club. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to this very auspicious event, the fourth memorial lecture and the launching of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center in the honor of our icon, Olorogo Michael C.O. Ibu. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we will take the national anthem and please let us in respect and honor of our national anthem do the needful as we take the national anthem. take the robo anthem like we all know the late Olorogo Michael Ibru was the Otota of Agbaroto Kingdom of Delta Central Delta State and he was a cultural man a traditional man a leader a father a family man a great entrepreneur a philanthropist very disciplined and an example and today the robo anthem will be rendered by none other than our beautiful daughter who is blessed in memory, the late Kefe. Can we all listen to the Robo Anthem or participate as we present to you the rendition by Kefe? <laughs> 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we'd like to, in honor of a life well lived, a life well spent, a life of impact, a transformational leader, to take a moment of silence in the honor of the late Olorogo Dr. Michael Christopher Ibru as his soul is resting in the bosom of the Most High. May we observe a moment of silence in his honor. May the soul of Olorogo Dr. Michael Christopher Ibru, may it rest in perfect peace in the bosom of the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, we'd like to have the opening prayer. I'd like you to use the chat room to tell us where you are joining from. So the chat room is quite busy. Can you use the chat room and greet everyone and tell us where you're joining us from so that we get a sense of the, those joining us all over the world. At this point, I'd like to call on none other than the Reverend Gabriel Bangba to give us the opening yeah. prayer. So Reverend, your yeah. mic is yeah. on. Yeah. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the life of your servant, Olorogu Michael, CEO Hebrew, whom you gave to us. We thank you for the life he led and the legacy he left behind. We thank you for the Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University we thank you for the visitor. We thank you, Lord, for today, as for we today. organize the fourth Ologu Michael C.O. Hebrew Memorial Lecture and the official launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. Receive the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray that you will come and take charge even in the course of this program, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that new knowledge will be revealed in the course of this lecture. We pray, Lord, that new grounds will be broken in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that excellence will be achieved 
Heavenly Father, we commit all the guest speakers and organizers into your hands. We pray, Lord, that everyone will be blessed today. Everyone will receive new enlightenment. Everyone will receive new knowledge. Lord, that the knowledge will be put to use for the development of mankind. And hereby, therefore, we say that you will take charge, even as we declare this program open in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, very distinguished Reverend Canon Gabriel Banga, J JP, for that powerful opening prayer. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we have commenced this memorial in the honor of our icon and our legend, the late Olorogo Michael Christopher Ebro. We have distinguished special guests of honor here with us. Let me say that we are all very distinguished wherever you are joining us from. Uh, and we know that uh, God who has brought you here has a purpose for this program. We want to admonish you to please stay tuned and stay connected as we go about introducing some of our guests who have joined us today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us the President General of the Urubu Progress Union Worldwide, who is the very distinguished chairman of today's uh, program, none other than Olorogun Dr. Moses Tiger here with us. Olorogun Moses Tiger, I'm going to ask you to greet Urubu and greet our guests here briefly before your chairman's address. Let's just be sure that you are here. Urubu Hey. Urubu Hey. Rubo Bijeria. Hey. Special guests, all of you, I welcome you for this great, great occasion. I'm very thank grateful you. to all of you. And I'm thankful to our lady, Madam Cecilia Ibru, for putting this together. I thank, I think I can see him, uh, Chief Ibru, Goody Ibru, and I also thank, of course, my favorite bro, uh, John C. Barole, and of course, Bismarck Rewane, and, and the, all the, uh, uh, Mr. Peter Bankole, that has agreed to come and give us this golden speech today, and of course, Professor Kila, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf, and of course, my twin brother that had his daughter already the same day with me, who today he is the MC of this occasion. I'm very grateful to you, Benson, for always being there available. And I'm very grateful to the professor, vice chancellor of this university, Mr. Fouakbe. God bless all of you. You are welcome and stay blessed. Thank you. Uh, that's the chairman of today's event, Olorogu Dr. Moses Taiga, the president general of Urubu Progress Union Worldwide. At this point, let me also quickly introduce uh, our guest of honor, none other than the very distinguished Goody M. Ebru, O-O-N, uh, principal partner at GM Ebru and co-member of the governing council at the Ajayi Crowder University and the former president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, as well as the president of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, Goody, your mic is unmuted. Can you greet everyone briefly? Okay, while we're sorting out Goody, uh, let me quickly also introduce our guest speaker uh, who will be giving us the lecture today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, I would like to say I'm very delighted to be participating in this webinar. I would like to greet everyone. I would like to join um, the President General of uh, Progress Union, and greeting all of you. I'd like to give a special greetings to the President General, Honorable Joseph Barue, my very good friend of Lagos Business School, 
where I was privileged at one time to be the chair, the president of the Alumni Association. Peter Bankole, I welcome you. I'd like to uh, greet uh, the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce, of which I'm a past president. I greet our good friend, um, Rewane Bismarck. I greet every participant, wherever he may be, anywhere in the world. I would like to make special uh, greetings to my big uh, cousin, uh, Chief um, Ike Clark, who I understand will be joining us from Abuja. I would like to say for me, it has been a very good honor to be participating in this um, webinar. And I'd like to congr congratulate the Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University for putting this webinar together and to congratulate you for sustaining the annual lectures. This has been the fourth of the series. I greet you all. Wado, Kobe, Hey, hey. The very distinguished Goody M. Ibru, thank you very much and uh, good to have you with us. At this point, let me call on Peter Bamkole to greet everyone and send greetings um, across the world for those participating. Uh, Mr. Peter, the over to you. I know that uh, you are a co-host already, so I'll mute your mic and, and greet us. Um, good afternoon, um, the chairman, uh, the president general of the Robo Progress Union Worldwide, uh, Olorogun Moses Tiger. Um, my senior brother, I call him uh, Godi Ibru. Um, I think out of all the members of the Ibru family, is probably the one that I've had the pleasure of working with most. Um, of course, uh, the chief launcher, uh, Olorogun uh, Johnson uh, Barowe. I hope I pronounce it uh, well. I wish uh, I could speak a little bit of Robo, but I will try. Um, Madam Cecilia Ibru, I also want to congratulate you and wish you well. I will say one or two things uh, later on, uh, but um, I don't know if it is right, but I will just say uh, good, good afternoon. I'm struggling not to say something that is wrong, so maybe I will just stay away from greeting in Robo. But it's a pleasure and indeed an honor to be part of this uh, celebration today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished uh, Peter Bankole. Uh, you could have done well to say Urubu Wadu. Uh, that would not be too much to do. And uh, I think in your next uh, presentation, you'll get it. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for the honor of accepting to be our guest speaker. Mr. Peter Bankole is a pioneer director of the Enterprise Development Center uh, of the Pan-Atlantic University. At this point, I'd like to introduce our chief launcher for this uh, program today of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, uh, a man that we are proud of, a visionary leader, uh, and also uh, a great Urobo icon who has contributed immensely also to the growth of uh, Urobo. He is none other than the very distinguished Olorogu Johnson Barue. Uh, Olorogu, your mic has been unmuted, and you greet Urobo. Robo Wado. Hey. Hey. Robo Wado. Hey. Hey. Robo Wado. Hey. Hey, Mama. Hey. Nigeria Wado. Hey. Aboyo Wado. Hey. Hey. Thank you very much. That's Olorogu Johnson Barrow at JP, uh, Managing Director of the Westminster College. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being gracious to be our chief launcher. Once again, welcome ladies and gentlemen all over the world joining us at this very auspicious uh, event, the fourth memorial lecture and the launching of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. Earlier today, we had the service in church that started at 8 a.m., a wonderful service in the honor of our great icon, once again, we say thank you all for joining us. At this point, I'd like to call on our chairman of today's ceremony, none other than Olorogu Moses Tiger, the president general of the Robo Progress Union worldwide, to give us his uh, chairman's opening address. 
President General. Thank you, Christo. Thank you, Benson. Rubuado. My class is Labour University of Ado, hey. including all the management, the vice chancellor, the senate, and all of that university. I greet you all. This is an open address by the chairman of the Fort Olorogu Michael Christopher Onaji Rewe Michael Ibru Memorial Lecture an official launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center delivered by me, Olorogu Moses Tiger, JP, President General, Rubo Progress Union Worldwide, on this 6th of September, 2020. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great honor to be here with you on this occasion to commemorate the life, times, and exploits of one of Nigeria's finest patriots, an inspirational industrialist, philanthropist, and a shining star of the Robo Nation. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this fourth annual Lurugu Michael C. O. Hebrew Memorial Lecture and the official launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, which is another insightful innovation of the Michael and Hebrew University at Baruto Delta State. Olorogu Michael Hebrew, OFR, was a lot of things to all of us. And no matter from what side you encountered him, his drive for innovation and the impact of his investment and his dedication to the advancement of human capital stood out exceedingly. <clears throat> he was an astute businessman and builder of an empire. His belief in people and their potentials were firm, pure, and unwavering. Such was his love for his Urobo people, Nigerians and Africans, that the Hebrew name was and is still synonymous with pride in self-worth and success. He provided the drive for sheer grit of willpower, accompanied by decisive action towards the realization of great successes. I recollect in 1972, as a young investment executive in the then Nigerian Industrial Development Bank, now Bank of Industry, Olorugu Michael wanted the NIDV to partner with him in an investment, and he sent his public relations manager, the late Clark C. Majumin, to come and invest and bring me to him. But I was not actually available the two days' time. Olorugu Michael would not like delays. And he did insist that he wanted to see me that day and that day only. And I went to his office at number 33 Creek Road, Papa, and I got and I got to him at 11 p.m. And he was waiting for me with his management team. He showed me the same sense of urgency in the matter of his Queen's Petroleum. He was the first Nigerian to propose indigenous ownership of oil acreage. Then, at 8 a.m. every Saturday morning, Chief Michael Ibru was with me in my office in Victoria Island. He did this as we got all the necessary papers and documents and submitted to the then head of state of Nigeria, President Ibrahim Baba Musi Babangida. Such he, was, he did not only get the acreage, but he had the right, first Nigerian right, to lift oil, for crude oil lifting. So he was determined, he was a go-getter and an achiever. At the time, he was the richest man in Africa. On this fourth anniversary of the Memorial Lecture in his honor, we want to focus on another area 
in the growth of human potential, innovation in entrepreneurship. This topic is apt with the national and global economic crisis and social disconnect caused by the coronavirus pandemic. All over the world, nations and peoples are looking for solutions and we must look for our own homegrown solutions. In doing that, however, we must think global, but be guided by our own peculiar local circumstances. We must come up with indigenous solutions. Africa already has a teeming population that is projected to grow exponentially in the years to come. There's a clear and present danger already, and the situation will grow worse if we do not come, come up with socioeconomic activities and solutions to productively engage these youths so that they can be useful members of the society. And at this unprecedented period in the global economy, where nations, institutions, and individuals are struggling to come to terms with the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on our usual way of life and doing business, understanding how innovation, entrepreneurship, change the rules of the game is a highly valuable mental resource to drive the economic revolution that is required to bounce out of this temporary law as the world adjusts to the new normal. I am very delighted that we have a seasoned expert in the person of Mr. Peter Bankole as the guest speaker. He will steer this discussion. I am confident that with his experience over the years, especially as the pioneer director of the Entrepreneurship Development Center of the Pan-Atlantic University, Lekki, Lagos, we shall leave this lecture with immense insights into becoming game changers who can deliver value in our respective enterprises. Anyone who knew the late Olorogu Michael Ibru would agree with me that his demeanor during this austere time would have been that of hope, faith, and earnest optimism. You will look at this period of economic decline and see an opportunity to innovate and add value. This is the same spirit with which we are gathered today. This is the same spirit the Michael and Sister Hebrew University symbolizes and from which the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center was birthed. It is to emulate this outstanding personality that we shall all participate in brainstorming and coming up with ideas and innovations to improve our country and advance the standard of living of our people. As an Europa man and the President General of the Europa Progress Union you know, worldwide, I'm immensely proud of the sustained legacy of a fellow Europa man who was a colossal and role model in business and entrepreneurship. I'm happy that young Europa men and women will look up and see a name they recognize and get the inspiration to aim for excellence because of Hebrew did it. Because if Hebrew did it, they too can. I'm equally happy that we'll come together every year in this memory, in this memory from within and outside Nigeria, from different walks of life and creed, and bring resources and thoughts together to tackle fundamental subjects in entrepreneurship development geared towards nation building. Once more, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this important event and wish us all a fruitful deliberation. Moses Tiger, President General, Rubo Progress Union, 6th of September, 2020. Thank you all. Thank you all, uh, distinguished Bolorogo Dr. Moses, Ogene Rume, Tiger, JP, President General, Rubo Progress Union Worldwide. Uh, that was a very powerful speech. Thank you for highlighting the great qualities of our icon and our legend. And uh, we thank God for his life and his blessed memory. God bless you. Once again, welcome ladies and gentlemen all over the world. 
wherever you are joining us from, you're welcome to the Fort Memorial Program in honor of the late icon, Olorogul Dr. Michael Christopher Ebro. Watch this short clip. Once again, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like you to tell us what qualities better describe the late Olorogo Michael Ebro for you. You can poll and vote quickly. It's multi choice, multiple choice. You can vote more. The answers, you can choose more than one in terms of what you think are some of his great qualities. Keep it coming. We have 40 seconds to go. Keep your voice coming. Okay. If you have not voted, please vote. I will also end the poll. Okay. So this is the result of the poll, and this is what you said. So six to nine percent say he is a great entrepreneur. Forty percent humble, for the six percent role model, visionary. Sixty-two percent. Philanthropic 49, nationalistic, all of the above 53%. So in summary, we all believe that Olorogu Michael Ibru meant something to us one way or the other. Thank you very much for participating in that vote. At this point, we'd like to take the citation in honor of our father, the late Olorogu Dr. Michael Christopher Ibru none other qualified to do this citation in his honor than Goody M. Ebru, O-O-N. Goody Ebru is a principal partner at GM Ebru and Co. He's also the member governing council at Ajayi Crowder University, a member of the Nigerian Bar Association. He was a former president of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, former chairman of Ikeja Hotel PLC, a past president of the Nigerian Russia Business Council and former president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite uh, Chief Goody Ibru to give us the citation of our father. Chief Goody, we can't hear you, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Great. We can see you and uh, we can see uh, Mommy. Thank you. Once again, I would like to congratulate the Michael and Cecilia 
Hebrew University for putting up this uh, webinar. I would like to say that um, I'm very delighted to be part of it. In fact, for me, it's a great honor and privilege. Uh, but before I proceed, I would like to mention that my better half, my dear wife, uh, Mova is with me on this program. You can see her on the screen. I would just like her to say for one short second to, to greet Robo. Robo Ado! Yay! Urobo Ado! Hey! Urobo Ado! Hey! Urobo Vienna! Hey! Hey! I congratulate uh, again the uh, university, the visitor, my dear sister, Cecilia Hebrew, members of council, and all those who are listening and participating in this uh, webinar. A special recognition to my elder cousin, Chief E. Clark, the chairman of the occasion, and president of UPU, Olorogo, Moses Tiger, the chief launcher, Johnson, uh, Olorogo Johnson Barole, my quintessential DG, I call him my quintessential DG. When I was president of the, Nigeria, of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce, um, Dr. Buda Yusuf, I would like to stand on the existing protocol. Before I read the citation of my brother, I'd just like to say that Olorugu Michaelibu was not just my elder brother. He was my mentor. And I was privileged to work very closely with him, both in my professional and business life. So it is a great honor to read his citation. Before I read his citation, I would like to tell you two st short stories. I'm conscious of time, so I'll be very brief. Somewhere along the line, you must have learned that uh, Lorugo was in the fishing industry and he had a lot of trawlers. He bought a lot of trawlers from uh, Japan and he had a partnership, a working relationship with one of the foremost uh, fishing companies in uh, Japan, known as uh, Tokyo Kogyo. So you would not be surprised, therefore, that um, Many Japanese, when they were in Nigeria, they came to pay homage and salute to Lord Michael Libro. And one of them told him that um, any Japanese that came to Lagos or Nigeria and did not meet with uh, Lord Michael Libro had not completed his tour. Because if he went back to Japan and he said he came to Nigeria and he didn't see Lord Michael Libro, then he would be very surprised. So that would give you an idea indication of how important and how highly regarded he was worldwide, especially in Japan. I'll tell you another short story. Once I was traveling from uh, Wari to Lagos, and my co-traveler made a very insightful comment, which I would like to share with you. He said, uh, Mr. Ebru, we are together in this aircraft. This aircraft is uh, owned by a different com own company, Aero Contractors. And when we get to Lagos, we'll be staying at Lagos Sheraton Hotel, an Hebrew hotel. The paper I have in front of me now that I'm reading is The Guardian. And it's an Hebrew newspaper. When I get to Lagos, I will be going to a bank. Oceanic Bank, an Hebrew bank. I think that of who the man Olorugu Michael Hebrew was. He touched the life of many, many people. I'll now proceed and read his citation. Olorugu Michael Hebrew lived a life unarguably unlike most others in the critical sense of the of his achievements as pastor. He was first among seven children of the late Pastor Peter Ibru, a, a missionary worker who was a nurse superintendent at the Bobby Orthopedic Hospital. 
and his wife played Madame Janet Motoko Ibru, a fish trader. Olorogo Michael Ibru, a trailblazer, an entrepreneur by excellence, attended the famous Gobi College, Lagos, between 1948 and 1951, during which time he distinguished himself in academics and extracurricular activities. And in his last year, was appointed the senior prefect, a position actually are uh, usually reserved for the best student and the with leadership strips. In 1948, he moved meteorologically to second class two, straight from elementary school. And in fourth year in 1951, on a study that normally lasted six years, passed the Cambridge school certificate. After Gobi College, he secured a job in the United African Company, now USEN as a manager in training, where between 1951 and 1956 he had an intense internship that effectively prepared him for the bigger world of entrepreneurship. In 1956, he resigned from USC, and at the age of 24, formed Laibru in partnership with an expatriate Jimmy Large, with whom he had worked at UAC. After successfully engaging in general trading, Olorogo Magabu set his size higher and much further afield. In 1957, he discovered that the frozen fish business was versatile, though a tough market to penetrate. At the time, expatriates farms and Nigerian traders were lurking. and very interested in the market. Vision to an area where no other Nigerian had dared, he literally pioneered the production and marketing of frozen fish, making tremendous success of a business in which foreign-owned West African fisheries and cold stores had failed. He single-handedly brought a change to the, for the better, the poor reputation in Nigeria that frozen fish had, waging a figurous campaign that successfully persuaded the whole nation that frozen fish was good, and thereafter establishing over 350 distribution depot throughout Nigeria. I must emphasize here that Ibru Sifu's network was all over the whole of Nigeria. There was no town or, or hamlet in Nigeria that uh, Ibru Sifu did not have a, a presence. He formed Ibru Seafoods, an important company solely owned by himself, and rented coastal facilities at the Jera Wharf in Lagos from the USC, and traded from the back of a Land Rover. He built his coastal facilities first at Tatsuki Papa. By the 1960s, Fish trading had become the traditional cash cow for the Ibro organization, through which he secured financing and other forms of capital to engage in large scale trading and branch out into other areas. The philanthropist that he is, out of his love for knowledge of Lord Michael Ibro, donated a college 
Abraham College, who was later renamed Hebrew College, to his people in Agbar Oto. He donated classroom blocks, vehicles, and money to various educational institutions and charity organizations. Awarded scholarships and deserving Nigerian students in secondary schools and institutions of higher learning in Nigeria and abroad, and sponsored various sporting activities to ensure and even development of the mind and the body. Besides the education, Michael Ebro was, was a major pillar in the economic empowerment of the robot nation. A source that craved anonymity once described his contribution in this vital aspect as follows. But over men and women profited at many levels since the rise of the Hebrew brand in the second half of the 1950s. First, Europe market women were among the first batch of Nigerians to embrace the Hebrew frozen fish. Many of them rose from relative poverty to higher economic brackets because they participated in the new Hebrew ventures from market stores. Besides education, Olorgo Michael Ibru was a major was a major pillar, as I mentioned earlier. Among the educated, he mentored professionals that rose to become financially independent in their chosen fields of endeavor. Incidentally, most of these robo indigenous at one time or the other worked within the vast conglomerate owned by Logo Macalibro and left to pursue their own independent dreams conceived in the Hebrew organization. Macalibro himself embraced the robo culture and robo cultural organization, especially Robo Progress Union, in a manner then that delighted the robo nation. It is Logo Macalibro who popularized the use of the title Ologo in place of chief. Hence today we have uh, Ologo Moses Daga, Ologo Joseph Barwe, Justin Barwe. Michael Ebro himself in 1963, chartered his first fishing vessel from Toyokogyo of Japan. And two years later, in 1965, he founded Osage Fishing Company in partnership with the Japanese conglomerate, one of the largest shipping company, fishing companies in the world. At the time, he had a, a fleet of 25 trawlers a fleet of five trawlers. By the end of the 1960s, Lorgo Michael Ibru had branched out into other areas of the economy. In 1969, a transportation company called Rutam engaged in the marketing and distribution of Mazda cars by Sabiem, Tata, and Jeep brands of automobiles, which were later acquired. At a time, Rutan was appointed by the federal government as the major distributor of the Peugeot brand of uh, vehicles in the country. In 1965, he started a large palm oil plantation at Ada Farm in the Old Bento State, as well as a citrus and pineapple farm on a 800 hectares site, which for some time supplied the Lafia Canary in our state. He acquired the Bishop Farms in 1973 
Uh, at that time, the farm was the largest producer of dairy old chicks and processed poultry in West Africa. He has started his business adventure with the acquisition of Nigerian Hardwood, a logging and sawmilling and processing company at Obi Aruko, at low cost, at low price from the Latham Group in the UK. The late Oluru Michaelibu's early successes in business can, however, be attributed to the assistance received from his members of the family. While his mother in her early life was a long distance trader in the creeks of the Niger Delta, whose familiarity with fish was invaluable, the unsung hero in the initial push to huge success by the elders of the Hebrew family, her austere father, Peter Petty, who ensured that his first sons, the monies, were safeguarded in a vault over which this patriarch kept watch. In the end, the inclusion of my siblings, wives, children, and associates in the management of the companies of the organization is seen as a move that has greatly enriched the totalities of the Hebrew clan. Awards and recognition, the late Oluruku Michael Hebrew contribution to the well-being of Iyadi has not gone unnoticed as he was been, has been honored locally and internationally. In full recognition of his dedicated service to the cause of education and willingness to offer sponsorship of that cause, the former Midwest government appointed Oroko Michael Ibru, member of the Provisional Council of the University of Benin in 1975. He was also appointed member of the Economic Cabinet Committee of the former Midwest state of Nigeria. Aside from being a member of the African Development Bank President's Roundtable of Businessmen in Africa, he was a member of the Business Advisory Council of the International Finance Corporation. That is the highest finance development bank in the world. His exploits in the field of business has also afforded him the opportunity to serve as country member of Legal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Nigeria United States Business Council. Among the awards, he garnered his life, lifetime uh, officer of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, OFR, in 1981, Outstanding Businessman Award of the Nigerian American Chamber of Commerce and Industry, 1983. Honorary Doctor of Law, the Honorary LLD of the University of Benin, 1978, and University of Ibadan, 1978. Doctor of Agriculture, Honoris Causa, University of Agriculture, Abeokuta, 2004. In addition, in 2003, he won the Zeke Prize in Leadership and in 2005, he received the prestigious Dr. Kwame Nkrumah Excellence in Enterprise Award. By yesterday, a glorious end that calls for a celebration came from the patriarch of the illustrious Hebrew family. A man once described by one among his rural clan, a poor policy musician as the Bong Park, who opened channels of riches an investment for a visionary guiding hand, a model of character and educator, a lover of family, a humanitarian par excellence. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a visioner, a leader, a patriarch of the Hebrew family a distinguished Nigerian, an international entrepreneur, Olorgo Magalibro. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a very powerful citation in the honor of an icon and a legend, the late Olorgo Michael Ibro, done by the very distinguished Chief Goody Ibru O-O-N. Chief and Mrs. Goody Ibru, God bless you and thank you very much for such a fantastic 
citation in honor of your very beloved brother. If you are joining us, wherever you are joining us from, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this wonderful program, which is a fourth memorial in the honor of the late Olorogo Michael Christopher Ibro. For some of you who really don't know much about him, we have a documentary in his honor, which we'll play very shortly. But before that, I'd like to quickly welcome some of our very distinguished guests. We have the honor of His Excellency, the Deputy Senate President, Senator Uvi Omuagege, joining us here in this memorial. We also have uh, the very honor of uh, Honorable Francis Waibe, uh, representing Ugeli Federal Constituency, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, the Chief of Air Staff is also here with us. Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar, and a host of very distinguished guests here with us. I want to be sure that uh, our Deputy Senate President is here. So I'm going to ask him if he's here to kindly greet Urobo uh, before we proceed as a mark of respect and honor. Okay. Uh, I've unmuted your mic, sir, Deputy Senate President. Can you say hello to Robo and to the general participants if you're here? Urubu Wado. Hey. Urubu Wado. Hey. Urubu Delta Nigeria, Mr. Shiagware. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome. Thank you. Distinguished Senator Uvi Omagige is a Deputy Senate President of the National Assembly. He is a true son of Robo, an icon and a great leader that we are proud of. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm also going to ask um, the Chief of Air Staff, uh, Air Marshal Sadiq, to unmute his mic and greet all the participants joining us all over the world. Air Marshal Sadiq, Chief of Air Staff, please greet everyone. Um, distinguished guests here, uh, I am Air Vice Marshal Emmanuel Chuku representing the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Baba Sadiq Abubakar, who is unavoidably absent due to all their other higher national assignments. Thank you so much for being here. I greet everyone. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Honorable Francis Waibe uh, to unmute his mic and greet Robo and greet all our participants joining us all over the world. Francis, your mic is unmuted. Please greet everyone. Robado, Robado, Mielia, all the other Robo, Walker Macabro, Eroma Muroboda, Roma Boedata, Roma Nigeria, Mielia. Thank you. I'm also going to ask this Macaroni to. Unmute his mic and greet all the participants joining us all over the world. Bismarck, your mic Robo is unmuted. Hey. Robo Wado. Hey. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and delighted to be part of this uh, process in recognition of a great icon, um, an entrepreneur, an innovator, a leader, a role model. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Muda Yusuf, the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, a council that was led by our very big brother, uh, distinguished Dr. Olorogu Gudi Ibru, to greet uh, everyone. Uh, Muda Yusuf, can you unmute your mic and say hello to everyone? So you arranged for this woman uh, for an interview for Wednesday, Ali. Are you there? All 
Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Olayemi to unmute her mic and say, say hello to everyone and greet everyone, one of our distinguished panelists, uh, Mrs. Olayemi. Okay, I suspect uh, they may be having some network. Hey. Um, good, evening, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here um, to witness this occasion in honor of a man that was clearly a visionary, a leader of his people, and a benefactor to all. I'm happy to be here. It's a great session, and I'm enjoying it already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Olayemi is one of our panelists today, and will be talking to us shortly. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take the documentary in honor of, of a man that we are all very proud of. And that's why we are all here today. The legacy documentary of the life of Ologa Michael Ebro. Please watch. This is the story of one of Africa's greatest entrepreneurs. On the 25th of December 1930, a boy named Michael Ibru was born. In eight and a half decades, he made more than just a name for himself. He embedded the Hebrew name into Nigeria's culture. His legacy supersedes wealth, as surprisingly what most people seek to emulate from this quintessential businessman was his humility. He was once described as the man with the Midas touch, as every business he touched ultimately flourished. This is the story of the Otota of Agbara Kingdom, Olorogun Michael C.O. Ibru, O.F.R. Although he was born in Delta State, his father, the late Chief Park Ekpeti Ibru, was an Urubu missionary living in Lagos, who was a lover of religion and education. He worked as a nursing superintendent at the National Orthopedic Hospital in Ibubi, Lagos. His mother, the late chief, Madam Janet Homotogo Ibu, who descended from a long line of wealthy merchants and political leaders, was a commodities trader in the Niger Delta. With such a background, no wonder that he developed and emulated from his parents a love for family, religion, education, and an insight for business. Olorogo, Michael Ibru's big heart and generosity was not just for his family members alone, as he touched the lives of the men and women, not just from his village, Agbaroto, in Delta State, but indeed all over Nigeria. As a bright and exceptional youth, Olorogo Michael attended the Gobi College in 1946, which was one of the best institutions in Nigeria. He excelled in academics and completed his six-year education in less than four years. During his time in school, he was appointed as the head boy and was outstanding in football and cricket. After school, he became a trainee manager with UAC. It is believed that this is where his instinctive foresight for business was sharpened. As at 24, his first step in entrepreneurship was to form a trading company called Laibro in conjunction with his English partner, Mr. Jimmy Large. During the mid-1950s, he managed to break into the then untouched market of importing frozen fish into the country in order to alleviate protein deficiency among the Nigerian people. Crystallizing on the distribution of frozen fish with a humanitarian objective of eliminating malnutrition among Nigerian people, he provided Nigerians with a low price 
highest high protein food source. And most importantly, we operated a successful distribution network, which penetrated densely populated southern regions and extended over 1,000 kilometers towards the Sahara. Ibru Seafoods became the cash cow for the group of companies that would later be known as the Ibru Organization. It expanded into one of the largest indigenous business operations in the whole of West Africa. Taking a further look into the Ibru Organization, one discovers several companies, complex in operations and globally significant. Its transactions and connections spread beyond Nigeria to the rest of West Africa, North Africa, Western Europe, the USSR, North America, the Far East, and Australia. The size and complexity of the Ibru organization's businesses necessitated the formation and diversification into several other sectors. Ibru rapidly expanded into aviation, hospitality, tourism, banking, automobile distribution, publishing, pump oil production, and so much more. Chief Michael Ibru created a common garden which continuously blossomed with investments on land, sea, and air. Chief displayed the talent to direct multi-channel businesses. It is no wonder that he was appointed as a member of the Economic Cabinet Committee, a member of the African Development Bank, the chairman of the Nigerian Institute, the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and a member of the Nigeria-US Business Council. First, a religious family man, a philanthropist, then a man who wholly invested in other people's lives. Michael Ibru brought on board to his business investment traders and market vendors who could strategically reach a vast population. He was a formidable businessman, born with an innate sixth sense for empire building. He was blessed with an acumen to develop any business into a multi-million pound enterprise. His philosophy was work and let thine works harvest speak for you. His slogan was service in humility. He was also a quiet philanthropist spreading his bounty to education, rural development, and better health for others. He built and donated the Hebrew College to government in Rabuto Delta to aid with the advancement of education in Nigeria. In his birth village, he built the first church, primary school, and university. As a practicing Christian before he passed, Chief Michael was generous with his wisdom and wealth. Olorogo Michael Ibru was influential across all sectors ranging from public to private and was revered amongst all businessmen and politicians alike who turned to him for advice. In 1973, he was honored with the title Olorogo of Agbara Oto and Olomo as well as the Otuta of Agbara. And shortly after, in 1981, was named an officer of the order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, OFR. From humble beginnings to a life of legacy, he lived a life of distinguished accomplishments and was unafraid to follow the rare path only traversed by exceptional men. His influence is unquantifiable. His impact is indescribable, and his vision to ameliorate the Nigerian nation was miraculous.
May his soul rest in perfect peace, knowing that he fulfilled his purpose on earth. Thank you very much. That was a documentary. That was a documentary in honor of the late Olorogo Michael Christopher Ebro. Once again, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world, and thank you for joining us. At this point, we'd like to bring our keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Bamkole, the Pioneer Director of the Enterprise Development Center, EDC of the Pan Atlantic University, for his presentation. Mr. Peter Pioneer, the Enterprise Development Center of the Pan Atlantic University in January 2003, which is now one of the top enterprise development centers in Africa, and I dare say the world. He is a trained mechanical engineer from the UK, MBA from the IESE Business School in Spain, an alumnus of the Lagos Business School, Chief Executive Program. He has 36 years of cognitive experience spanning both public and private sector. He's currently a PhD candidate at the International School of Management, ISM in Paris. Mr. Peter Bamkole led the Goodman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative in Nigeria and was a consultant to the project in Liberia. He initiated and led several partnership programs with diverse stakeholders. He is a consultant that is immensely across Africa on entrepreneurship development and practice. He is a member of the Pan Atlantic University Human Council, currently chairs the board of Nigerian Climate Innovation Center, International Breweries Foundation, and a member of the Lagos State Research and Innovation Council, among others. His current interest is designing new learning methods and e-support for SMEs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and privilege to have with us none other but the very distinguished Mr. Peter Bamkole as our keynote speaker. Mr. Peter, you're welcome. Please, can you carry on with your presentation as I welcome you here? It appears we have uh, Peter Bamkole is trying to connect with uh, his network. So we will take a short break and uh, we will continue the program while we wait for our keynote speaker to come on board at a point in time. We'll take a short music interlude. Uh, for those of you who don't hear Robo, uh, what, we are, what we are going to play now is an Robo song just for your listening pleasure. Sorry for that. Hey, Mr. Peter, you're welcome. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I was putting it in the chat that I could not unmute myself. Uh, so sorry about that. Urubu uh, Wado. Hey. Aha, so I tried this time. <laughs> you did well. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, to share my screen and um, we will get it going. 
So let me start by thanking the Michael and, and Cecilia Ebru Foundation uh, for inviting me uh, for, to give this um, fourth memorial lecture in honor of a gentleman um, that we all know as Olorogo, uh, Michael Ebru. I was looking when the uh, host was, was doing the, the poll, I was looking for a different way of describing him uh, because uh, close to maybe 36, 37 years ago, uh, as a young engineer, um, he was my chairman. And perhaps a, a number of people did not know. And he was my chairman in the then Elf Oil Nigeria, uh, of which um, I, I started off at 33 Creek Road. So it has moved from being just his office to the office of uh, Elf Oil Nigeria. Um, of course, I need to thank the, the visitor um, to the university, Madam Cecilia Ibru, who our uh, paths have crossed, but not um, you know, very closely. Uh, last year was the, the, the recent ex experience when um, we came together to honor your sister, uh, Mrs. Daisy, on his 70th. And the, the speech you gave, in my opinion, uh, showed how family person you are and how you carried your siblings. So thank you very much for that. Of course, like I said earlier, the, uh, the closest to the Hebrew family for me was uh, my, my big brother, uh, Mr. Goody Hebrew. Um, I thank you for the relationship we've had up until now. And it's nice seeing you looking uh, still very young, even at this, at this time. So uh, let me start on the existing protocol uh, in order to save time. And this afternoon, I'm going to be speaking about innovation in entrepreneurship changes the rules of the game. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of the experiences that I've had in the last uh, close to two decades that I've established the Enterprise Center at the Pan-Atlantic University, which some of you probably will, will know better as the Lagos Business School. Whatever problems exist, uh, entrepreneurs will always scramble to provide multiple solutions. And these solutions, as they scramble to provide them, will lead to creation of products, services, and ultimately ventures, as we have seen. Uh, in, in the life and times of Olorogo Michael Ibu. Let me make an analogy, uh, and, and I like football uh, to be used. In football, there are rules. Uh, if you are offside, your, your goal doesn't count. Uh, if you tackle somebody from the back, there are, there are penalties for that, and, and so on and so forth. And so, these rules are well understood by every player and indeed those that are regulating uh, the player field. But can you imagine for one second that this Nigerian player, number 22, has the capacity to change the rule of the game? Now, that means once he changes it, everybody needs to quickly understand, adapt, and begin to play according to that new rule. Now, beyond him having the capacity, can you imagine if all the 22 players on the field of play can actually change the rules of the game? Then it gets even more exciting. That is what innovation brings into entrepreneurship. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. You know, when you hear about Apple and every time they try to launch a new iPhone, uh, you will see very long queues uh, in the US for people wanting to be the first to buy it. Uh, you have people that would have um, even uh, made advance payment to be able to have access to this new phone. So the question is, why do people 
believe so much in a new product when they have not actually experienced it. It's because that company has developed the capacity to be seen as an innovation, innovative company. So the customer trusts and believes that irrespective of the product they will bring out, they are almost certain that it will be an innovative product and there is something that will benefit them. That is the sweetest level any company can get to because then it is like your customer have absolute trust in you to be able to make them experience something better each time. I'd like to reflect in my days as an engineering student in the UK. Um, every weekend, uh, that was my, like, about four decades ago. Every weekend, I used to travel across the UK uh, because I love photography. It is one of my hobbies then. Uh, but I couldn't use one camera because I wanted to take mostly landscape photography. So I would go to, you know, wonderful buildings, beaches, and, and, and places of interest. And I would set my tripod, you know, I change my lenses, all kinds of stuff. So the SLR was the best camera then that professional used for this kind of stuff. And I had one, in fact, I had a bag that I kept all those things in. But also I, I, I had to carry an autofocus camera because uh, it's easy, it's fast when I want to take action camera. Fast forward, forward a couple of decades uh, after that, my S10 will not only do these two things, um, all the things that this two camera does, but it will geotag my location, it will date stamp, and it will send it immediately to wherever I want it sent on, on social media and everything. And look at how small it is compared to all the troubles I had to go back to two decades ago. However, in the last 10 years or so, we have even seen the likes of, of Samsung and iPhone constantly disrupting themselves. And so in less than six months, a new iPhone or a new uh, uh, Samsung will come up because they have listened to the customers and they are trying, uh, running like marathon to be able to beat and supersede the customer's experience. In the banking industry, it was a little bit different. You know, uh, when I started uh, in, in Elf Oil, uh, I, was, I was the engineer in charge of the NOS, the, the te technical sales. And, and that meant I had to move from uh, Sokoto to Medugri to Yola to Mina, all by road. And to give you a sense of how often I travel, I was doing something like um, 10,000 kilometers every month, which meant I had to service my car every two weeks. Uh, and I had to change my car um, every six months because it was 60,000 I achieved it in, in six months. And so I, I literally was going around companies, solving technical problems and, and sleeping in, in hotels and, and all the likes. And, and although it was very safe then, uh, I couldn't carry cash a lot. Uh, but the banking industry was not as advanced in those days. Uh, we had to rely on uh, checks. Of course, that was the time of uh, tally, tally number. I'm sorry, a lot of you will know. But there came one bank that tried to innovate around this because it took 21 days to even clear um, an upcountry check. And so this bank had what we call a fixed check book where we had 20 or 25 check leaves and every check leave was exactly 200 naira, no more, no less. So once you get to the bank and you present it, they will only give you 200 naira. Of course, uh, at that time, 200 naira was more than enough uh, to, to solve my traveling issues uh, for one week. So, and, and for you to understand better, uh, to fill my tank then was not just five, five naira. So 200 naira was quite a lot. But then 
after that, what we called innovation at that time, we've had series and multiples of innovation within the banking sector. Uh, of course, we had the, the ATMs coming in, the credit and the debit cards, and more recently, uh, we have the mobile banking. And I dare say that the, the banking industry in Nigeria is possibly one of the best uh, in, in the world. Of course, um, when it comes to security, we're probably the best. Of course, you know we are very intelligent in that area. But all of a sudden, even the so-called innovative and the innovation that we're seeing in the banking industry is currently and may even be disrupted by the fintech that we have in today. Of course, the banks too will innovate, just like uh, the, the, the camera industries, they too, they, they, they've started innovating. So the SLR now has now graduated to a point where, as you are also taking um, your cameras, they have Wi-Fi enablement, and they too can also do what some of these camera phones can do. Now, let me move very quickly into um, innovation. And there are many people that look at innovation from different angles. Um, of course, there are uh, the models where you say four, some five, but I, tr I, I think it's best to classify innovation types into three. Uh, one that focuses on products or service, the other one that focuses on innovation, and then the third one around business model. And so what I'm gonna to try to do is to walk us through these three elements and to see um, how that plays out and how that innovation, whether it's in products, process, or business model, can indeed change the rules of the game. Let me start with product innovation. Um, for product innovation, this is the one that is very common. This is the one that perhaps we're used to. Uh, it's around improvement in either an existing product or service, uh, or maybe you add additional feature or features. Uh, sometimes uh, you have a brand new product or service. Uh, and, and if you take just, let's say, uh, the mobile technology uh, and how that has enabled many entrepreneurs to innovate around the mobile banking technology. So, I mean, around the mobile technology. So if you look at the banking industry, you will see that, that mobile technology is playing a major role now uh, in mobile money, money transfers. And, and so a lot of people that did not have access to financial transactions today, because of that innovation in the banking uh, sector, they are now able to have access to it. But it's a, it's a product uh, innovation. Uh, if you look at what has happened in the last uh, six months in particular, we've now had a lot of uh, young people in particular uh, leveraging on, on, on mobile technology, the fact that most of us were locked down and then telemedicine is becoming more acceptable in our times today. Um, I have used telemedicine in the last six months uh, during the lockdown, and I, I find it very interesting. I, a lot of uh, hospitals are now finding their feet to be able to make it work even in, in Nigeria. And so this will not have been possible if we did not have the mobile technology that it rides upon. Again, for EduTech, it's exactly the same thing. Um, all schools were shut down uh, following the, the, the COVID situation, and all of us were asked to move online. Uh, of course, we, we moved online. I will share with you uh, some of the innovations that, that happened, but that is more around uh, process rather than product. Look at what is happening in Netflix. Um, of course, because of the improvement we've had now in um, internet access and of course the, the bandwidth that, that uh, we are able to access, uh, many more are now moving uh, from cable into internet-based um, uh, viewing. So Netflix all of a sudden is becoming more popular and more popular in Nigeria. 
But one thing about their service, which is, is, is interesting, is the innovation that they have brought into it. There is a particular software that studies the kind of, of uh, movies that you watch. Uh, so if you watch uh, scary movies and you watch things that you know, can be profiled, once you finish watching it, then that knowledge of profiling you, they will use this to serve you the next movie you can watch. And you know, that is the most interesting service a viewing customer can have because there are multiples of things to watch. I don't even know which one to watch. But imagine once they serve you, you watch it and you like it, and they serve you again, you, of course, you just rely on them to continue to serve you. That is about customer profiling. In the same way, because majority of the people are now transacting digitally, of course, down, this has been heightened significantly, where, you know, from your home, you could order things and they would deliver it to your, to your house, or office, wherever. And because of that, they have access to data, data about your telephone number, about uh, your, your preferences, about your, your house, and so many things. And real time, they can actually hot map and mine those data. And immediately what that means is that as they are miming it, they can say quickly that X number of people on a weekly basis will request for jollof rice with chicken in this area. And very quickly. And because of that, a company that understands how to mine data can say, this is the best place to go and locate a chicken and rice outlet, for instance. So we're going to see more and more uh, innovation coming out of data mining. But all of that is built around product or service innovation. Uh, a couple of days ago, um, I was on a panel that um, to select the Enterprise World Cup uh, finalist. And uh, one of the finalists that really got my attention was uh, Inkechi Indemachi, uh, founder of the uh, Machi Ed Foods. Now, young lady with kids that have allergies. And, and, you know, when she was making a pitch, she said, on a count of one to 10, my kids had all the allergies you can think of. And so recall when I said, Wherever there is problems, entrepreneurs will look for those solutions. That's who they are. That's what they do. And so this lady started to look for those things inside everything that her kids were eating that was not good for them. And that led her to produce all of these products. And in fact, this is just some of the products. And if you, if you Google her or if you go into her Instagram page, you will see, or Facebook, you will see all of this. Today, she's one of those that are now competing at that uh, global uh, competition. And this is coming out of Nigeria. This is what product innovation does. You look at the problem, you find a solution, and you create a product or service to this. This goosey uh, seed butter, it's made out of a goosey or something like that. Most of these products are gluten free and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, innovation is the only one or the ingredient that will get you three, four, five steps ahead of competition. Because people can eat chips, but then she made her own Fiesta chips. Now, even these Fiesta chips, of course she knows the taste buds of our people then she spiced it up. This is what innovation is all about as far as product is concerned. For process, it's slightly different. Um, it, it, it's, it's how a product is, it, is produced or how a service is delivered. Uh, and, and this is from the input level right down to the sales level. And it, it's very interesting as I, also 
uh, sat down and analyzed how people are innovated over the last six months in the area of process. Um, there was this lady who, who served uh, a caterer, a fine, fine caterer. But of course, when uh, the lockdown started, what did most of them do? Most of them moved from restaurants to their kitchen. And so uh, we had these uh, posters coming up. Yes, the restaurant is closed, but the kitchen remains open. And, and so you could order, they will deliver it, and so on and so forth. But it wasn't quite the same for a number of people. Uh, people got fed up after the first maybe a couple of months or so. Uh, people really want to have that you know, experience again of, of dining. And this lady just innovated around process. And then, so what does she do? She brings a five-star high-end brunches to your home. So you could be a family of six or seven, whatever, uh, or 10. So she could set up in your garden. She could set up in your big sitting room. And then you will just see the whole place transformed into a, a five-star hotel like, like uh, Sheraton that uh, my big brother has. And then you had all these multiple choices of what you can eat and so on and so forth. It's like privatizing this service into your home. So it's a process. So rather than send the product to you, the changes the way the process or how that uh, uh, food is being delivered to you. That's a process innovation. And of course, every single week, I understand she was having a lot and lots of people, of course, who were requesting for these services. For us, we had to move very quickly uh, online and, and our students were being taught online. So luckily for us, we had a learning management system and it, it wasn't so bad. So once you have a smart device and uh, you have internet access, it was, it was easy. However, we needed to reach other people who did not have smartphones and did not have access to the internet. And so we had to re-engineer and innovate around our process of delivering education to those that do not have smart devices or access to the internet. And I'm sure you probably will have experienced uh, IVR one way or the other. When you dial into a company and then the phone will say, if you want um, sales, please press one. If you want uh, operations, please press two. Um, otherwise, please press zero or hold on or something like that. Now that is a customer service tool, which that is called interactive voice response. And we now have to use or innovate around that tool that have existed in ticket to be able to use it to deliver uh, learning to people that do not have access. Of course, it meant that we have to talk to the service provider uh, for, for voice, and we have to recreate learning using feature phones. By end of this month, uh, this is gonna go live. We're already doing testing on it, but that's how you innovate around process. But the one that is even more interesting is, is machine learning. Um, we, we had different types of um, applications that we had to process, and it meant that you had to read all those applications mark them based on the marking criteria. It was okay if all you had to mark was even a thousand. Uh, within a couple of weeks, maybe three, you will, you know, with maybe 20 or 30 markers, you're done. But when those application processes are in the order of hundreds of thousands, then you have a big situation. And this is where machine learning uh, comes in handy. So over the last three months, we had been teaching the machine how we have been marking in the last four to five years so that we can then bring the machine into the, uh, the conversation 
and the machine will mark, let's say we have 100,000 and we want to choose um, 5,000. We will get the machine to begin to mark from 100,000 and mark down to about 10 or 15,000. And then we bring the human markers to be able to finish up. But interestingly, you will see that there isn't much difference based on how the machine has learned the way you have been marking historically. Then when we finish marking the remaining 10 or 15,000, we will use the result of that to teach the machine again. So each time the machine gets uh, more intelligent around how to, to mark. And so it gets better, it gets better each time. So all of a sudden, what does that do? Because you are innovating around your process, you can easily have 1 million applications. You can process it faster than somebody who is doing it the manual way. And then it will still work out cheaper and you will deliver a, a much better outcome than the person that is marking manually. This is how you innovate around process. But the one that excites me most is, is business model innovation uh, because it is holistic in nature. Uh, it's typically organizational wide and in most, in some cases, it's even ecosystem wide. Now, what does that mean? It, it, it means if you take, let's say, Google Map as, as an example, um, 15, let's say 50% uh, every year I walk out of Nigeria. So, and, and because of the work we do, I mean, different countries that I, I don't even know, you know, the roads, where to go and so on and so forth. But since the introduction of Google Maps, I don't feel like a stranger anymore. Because once I have an internet connection, I can easily, easily find my way. Uh, if I even need to go to a restaurant, place to, work, to, to visit and so on, Google Map will tell me much more than the street. Imagine in those days, um, we used to use street maps, the hard copy. Then from there, they graduated to SatNav. And SatNav dis, the, you know, uh, disrupted uh, the, uh, the hard copy uh, street maps. But Google Maps came, and then you have the whole map of the world in your hand. And that disrupted even the SatNav. And so innovation is, the, is constantly helping us to redefine the rules of the game. And any business or any venture that refuses to innovate constantly will have it itself to blame because it won't take more than, before we will say it won't take more than a decade. But these days, it may not even take more than a couple of years because a lot of people are innovating around what they are doing. Even for Google Maps, they have local vendors, local uh, experts who will tell them a lot about their areas and they are volunteering and they are doing it for free. So the map gets updated regularly the places to visit get uh, regularly rated, and interestingly, it means you can have the best of all worlds. Let me use uh, the hospitality industry, uh, and I hope uh, my brother, uh, Goody Ibro, will, will not mind this. I deliberately did not push Sheraton here so that there will be no conflict. Now, a hotel, for those that are in the hospitality industry, hotel was fantastic place of rest, and, and hotels started, um, you know, loyalty programs acquiring different types of, of, of hotels because as a traveler, um, you don't necessarily have to stay in the same hotel all the time. It depends on what you are doing. So your behavior changes depending on why you are making that traveling. So if I'm traveling alone, uh, and I have a quick stop, I would stay in a different hotel. If I'm traveling with my family and I needed more space, I would stay in a different hotel. If I'm traveling for a conference, I would stay in a different hotel and so on and so forth. So what most hotels then did was to have a chain of hotels where it caters for this type of behavioral changes and then you still get to keep your loyalty. And that became something that was of value. Uh, to most of the hotel chains until, of course, holiday resorts started coming up. So if you then want to go and do holidays, it was different. 
you, you go into a holiday resort. In fact, some people were buying uh, holiday um, con condos and, and they stayed there for two weeks, for four weeks, and so on and so forth. And then the challenge with holiday resorts, even though it was sweet and you could go to very interesting places, um, everything is all in one, you, you have you know, activities and the resorts, and you can keep families together uh, on those resorts. But the challenge with resort then was that they didn't, you know, they were not really in the city center. Most of them were out of town. And so that became an opportunity to be able to disrupt that industry again. And so innovation must constantly think about the customer and say, what else is the customer looking for that this present product or service is not able to, to give? And so Airbnb came into place. And then it means you can, for two days, three days, one week, you can go to anywhere. You can rent an apartment for three days. In fact, um, we had a few friends that um, this time last year, they had the destination event uh, in Malta. And most of the families um, had Airbnb apartment like within two, three meters walking radius. And so it felt like they were all in their village. And so they will visit the, each other, they will walk to each other's places, they will have barbecue, they will do all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, that is what Airbnb has brought into place to disrupt even the so-called holiday resorts. So constantly, innovation disrupts uh, in this. So in closing, without innovation in entrepreneurship, most ventures will have become obsolete. The rule of the games are constantly changing, thanks to, of course, innovation in entrepreneurship, as our world will always be better for it. I thank you very much for listening, and I'll take a few questions. Uh, Benson, over to you. Benson, over to you. Well, if Benson is not there, I understand. Thank you, uh, Thank you yeah. uh, Prof. Okay. I'm, I'm here, uh, Mr. Okay. Peter. Uh, we'll take a short break and uh, we would continue the session. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll have a first question and answer. Some questions have come in now. So let's take a short interlude. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, Mr. Peter Bankley. I'm, I'm tempted to call you a professor because uh, your delivery was very professorial. Uh, there are a few questions that people have um, asked, and I'd like to just take uh, two questions with you. Uh, the first question is on process innovation. Uh, and under process innovation, you talked about service delivery. You know that in our country today, service is a big issue, especially around the quality of service. So the question is, how do we ensure that excellence is part of the whole process in delivering service? One thing that uh, the late Olorugu Michael Ibru uh, was renowned for was the spirit of excellence. Today, you have a lot of businesses that are not sustainable because service is a challenge. There's been all kinds of arrangement around total quality management, service transformation, customer service, and so on and so forth. So what are your thoughts around service delivery? How do we sustain excellent service delivery? Thank you. Okay, I have a very simple solution to this. Very simple. Um, the reason why we are in business is because we want to serve our customers. And so all we need to do is just to listen to them. In fact, um, if, if I had presented a different approach to innovation and how you can bring uh, innovation into your business process, um, there are three, uh, but one that I always like most is the one that says, listen to your customers. Because the solution that you are looking for is with your customers. And so if your customer love what you do and there is a problem, they will come to you and they will tell you, Banky, you're not supposed to do it this way. Why don't you try this? I don't like this gray color, dark color, can you spice it up and put yellow or bright colors? So the solution will come from them. So my advice is listen, learn, and listen to the customers. And whatever it takes, so long as you listen to them and you do what they have said, of course, working together, you, the chances are that your organization will last even longer. I'll give you a very, not recent example, but Lego went through the same process. Lego was dying. Lego was dying until they brought a new CEO who then said, from now on, we're not going to create new products. We're going to stick with the same old product, but we're going to go out, we're going to listen to our customers. Recall each and every one of us had used Lego when we were growing up. Let's go to those people that have passed this Lego to their children, to their grandchildren, and let's listen to them. Listening then the form a uh, customer's committee or whatever they called it then. And out of that, they transformed the organization and they came back to profit level. So listen to your customers. They usually will have the solution for you. Thank you very much uh, for that response. Listen to your customers is, uh, is uh, what uh, Mr. Peter Bamkole advocates. The second question um, is around product innovation. COVID-19 has impacted a number of businesses, like you already know, uh, and you talked about improvement of existing products or service, as well as addition of new features and completely new products, which is almost like a blue ocean or differentiation. Now, uh, people are asking questions, given the current pandemic uh, that we all have to deal with, what are your thoughts around businesses that have been largely impacted by COVID-19? What would you recommend as a solution to product innovation? Okay, thank you very much. Um, just like many um, organizations, uh, the first couple of weeks, most of us were taken uh, by surprise. Of course, uh, as, as an enterprise center, we had anticipated this, and um, in fact, we shut down a week before the general lockdown. And so we were prepared. Um, we installed internet facilities, communication facilities in the homes of all of our people. And we spent the first two, three weeks to do research 
around this. And one of the things that came out of our research is that about 87% of the people were either confused, in dilemma, not happy, uh, losing money, all kinds of stuff, all the bad stuff. And then 13% of them were actually thriving. They were making money. And we said, how come that in the same economy, in the same environment with everything, majority were losing and a very few, small few, 13% were thriving. So we decided to dig deeper and study those 13%. One key thing is that you need to reimagine your business model. And I mentioned that briefly, that instead of um, having a restaurant, you have to rebuild it and say, your business model is around your kitchen rather than the restaurant. That's the business model. Secondly, you need to think about technology. We found out that most people that thrived leverage extensively on technology, either in being able to get their um, input or process or even And so during that period, we saw one of our, uh, one of our clients that started um, aggregating food stuff using technology from from farmers. And then we'll give them the time that they will come pick up their stuff. And that is one end, which is the supply end. And she would have also gathered um, the demand side using technology as well. So it's basically matching supply and de demand in a very transparent way. Technology played a major role. Yesterday, somebody was asking me, how come the banks did not suffer like the rest of us? Does it mean that they were not part of this COVID thing? I said, oh, you know that irrespective of COVID, whether we went to the bank or not, we were transacting digitally. And so things were happening. Tech, uh, technology was a big one. And then the final one was collaboration. What this has taught us is that you can no longer work on your own. And those 13% people collaborated a lot. So they focused on what they were doing and then they, uh, so they will link up with a logistics company who will do the, the last mile and so on and so forth. So you have to think of those three things, business model reengineering, technology, and collaboration. This, for me, will help you uh, to, to, to rethink of how to, to innovate around products. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Peter Bankole. One more question from the uh, university students. Uh, I think it would be, be nice to give our students an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, they asked a very important question, which is directly to you. And they are asking you, what is the biggest success factor that has helped you to be successful? Knowing that you've been the pioneer director of the Enterprise Development Center, you also have been involved in setting up you know, uh, entrepreneurship uh, initiatives across Africa, which has been largely successful. So. What is that biggest success factor for you? Um, it's, it's mindset. I call it mindset. And, and this is also what we are trying to change across the Nigerian university system. Um, I happen to chair um, the committee of directors of enterprise centers across Nigeria, uh, who uh, kicked off uh, by, uh, on the World Entrepreneurship Day. Uh, and our focus is on students. Uh, in fact, I, I've seen one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Poe uh, from uh, Bielsa, and, and the whole idea is we want to make sure that students are entrepreneurial right from the university. And I'm so happy that the uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center at the Michael uh, and, and Cecilia Ibru uh, University is, is, is coming on board. We will be glad to welcome you. It's mindset around it can be done. Even if you fail in trying to do it today, that means you have gone through the wrong route. Look for another route. And so you go through the second route. If you fail in the second round, you go to the third one. It is this idea of failing fast and moving quickly. So 
you don't wait for too long. You test your hypothesis. If it works, fantastic. You modify, you go on. If it doesn't, discard it and look for a different solution and move on. I think one of the things for me as a person is that um, I have, I, I wear dual cap, uh, maybe even more. One, my background is in engineering, so we are taught to, to think logically. Uh, but beyond that, of course, I have my entrepreneurship experience and even my doctoral studies is in, is in um, uh, e-learning and, and stuff like that. So for me, I can wear different caps at different times. So I can be an academia and I can be um, an engineer trying to struggle to make things happen. But because I have, uh, you know, year on year, seen that if you stay at it and you are faithful at it, and you are looking at it religiously, you will break it. And so I never imagined that something is not possible. Um, this IBR thing that I was telling you about and the machine learning, all of it came out of our COVID situation because we said to ourselves, we're going to come out of this. We have a lot of retreat time. If we don't make use of it, we're going to fall through the cracks. So we teach our students, for instance, um, entrepreneurship for one year in the school, in the, in the university, and they must start a business. They must start a business and they must make profit. And so we try to change their mindset around starting and running a business as a student, a second year student. And initially people say, oh, it's not possible. We need to focus on our school work. But hey, you don't have to. In fact, entrepreneurship will help you to do better in your school work. Um, when I was setting up uh, EDC in, in, in the US and I was in um, uh, Virginia University and I saw one 21 year old but I will never forget it. He was in his second or third year. He, he started running a business and he was meeting with his, uh, his vendors that day I was visiting. And this guy was turning over as a student, $1 million as a student. Yet his, his annual fees at the school was about $25 or $30,000. Now tell me, how can this student finish and go and get a job. No way. This guy will continue in the same way. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, impressed that at age 24, Olorogo Michael Ibu had the opportunity to continue in UAC and become, you know, the MD, CEO, whatever. But he said, no, I want to use my young age to work for myself. So he, he has seen the opportunity and that's why he became restless until he found solution to it. It's exactly the same thing. I, I will say finally, there was one student in uh, Cross River uh, University of Technology that was on the panel that we did last month. He was in his, it's in his final year, this is me. And this guy had a farm that is making enough profit to make multiples of his student fees. So I say, please just have that mindset and then all is possible. It's a very long way of answering a very simple question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very distinguished Mr. Peter Bamkole, uh, Pioneer Director of the Enterprise Development Center. That has been an awesome presentation from you. Uh, we must uh, appreciate you for your, uh, your presentation. Uh, if there are questions, we would send them to you um, later as we make progress. If you are joining us, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth Olorogu Dr. Michael Christopher Ibru OFRO Memorial Lecture. The lecture has just been delivered by none other than Mr. Peter Bamkole, the pioneer director of the Enterprise Development Center. We are also having the official launch of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, the EIC. We welcome every one of you joining us all over the world. Nigeria Wado. Urubuado, we welcome you all. I am told that we have uh, the very distinguished uh, honor of uh, Professor Gordon and Gigi Dara of the Delta State University. Gigi Dara would be giving us uh, a good message later on. We have the honor of Chief John Uguma also being part of this program with his wife, Chief and Mrs. John Uguma, um, all the way from Delta State. 
We have also the honor and pleasure of uh, uh, Chief Sylvester Sido joining us at this program. Also Chief Uagbedia joining us. We have uh, Professor Hope Egaga of the uh, Urobo Renaissance Movement. We have Olorogo Edore Agba, the president of Urobo Social Club joining us. We have the UPU presidents joining us from UK and all over the world, Lagos, Nigeria. We also have uh, with us uh, architect Chief Charles Majuro uh, of the Foundation, Robo Foundation and the uh, webinar group. Dr. Otive Igbuzo of the uh, Robo webinar group also joining us. We have uh, with us uh, some of our panelists. They were not here when I introduced them. Professor Anthony Kila, Professor Ibi Nkafu Ape of the uh, MCIU, Michael Cecilia Ibru University. We have the very distinguished Dr. Muda Yusuf, the Director General, according to uh, the past president, uh, Mr. Goody Ibro, the quintessential Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And we also have Mr. Obaru Usa, the Regional uh, Executive for the Southeast SME focused of the Bank of Industry as part of our panelists today. Wherever you are joining us, we welcome you all. Uh, we'll take a short interlude, and then we can now uh, go into the next item on the agenda, uh, which is the panel session. Let's take this tribute again. You're welcome. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we would want to introduce our panelists to you uh, to go right into the panel discussion. We have with us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the very distinguished Mr. Bismarck Rewane, the Managing Director and CEO of Financial Derivatives Company Limited. We also have with us Mrs. Olayemi Ayanichi, the Managing Director of Ceftron Pro Frost. We have also Dr. Musa, Musa Yusuf, the Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have Mr. Obaru Osa, Regional Manager, Bank of Industry Southeast. We have also Professor Ibi Inkafu Akbe, the Vice Chancellor of the Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University, Agbaroto. And last but not the least, the very distinguished Professor Anthony Kila for the Center of International and Professional Studies. We want to say a very big welcome to 
our very distinguished uh, panelists. Let me start with Bismarck Rewane. Uh, listening to the keynote speaker, uh, would like to get your thoughts on what you think entrepreneurs today. You are an economist, and I've seen that you've done a lot of analysis on the economy. You're also a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria. What are your thoughts around entrepreneurship in Nigeria, especially thinking about uh, the interest <laughs> rates and the recent increase in the cost of uh, PMS, and also uh, DSTV has increased, power has increased, and everybody is a bit worried. What are your thoughts and what can entrepreneurs, especially SMEs, do in times like this? Mr. Bismarck. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me stand on existing protocols. But I'd like to correct, I'm not a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank. Uh, so I would have nothing to do with interest rates as they stand today. But I belong to the Economic Advisory Council of the President, uh, who looked at broad policies and uh, advice in camera. Uh, but having said that, I, I want to refer to Peter Bankole's um, presentation. I think he, re he related this to Chief Ibu's audacity to take risk, his, um, his recklessness to disrupt, even when disruption was even in the lexicon, the business lexicon in Nigeria and, and globally. So we must credit to Chief Michael Ibu being innovative and all that. Also, I wanted to add a few things. Uh, towards his innovativeness and restlessness. Uh, many years, first of all, bringing ice fish to the people, which everybody thought was substandard, but then became the staple after a while and became a, uh, widely consumed and made, it, made a fortune out of that. Uh, I remember many years ago, there was what they called a rotary, Rutam Motors was belonged to the Hebrews and people now talked about the rotary engine. This was before fuel injection and all the other things. I, I, don't, I didn't understand how Chief Ibo had the courage to introduce the rotary engine, which became the basis of, and the foundation of a lot of automobile disruption at that time. So you could see that he, uh, he had no fear of risk as long as he, he could manage it and you know, mitigate it. And he took calculated risks. Uh, you could see the, somebody talked about the total integration from the airline to the bank to the hotel and everything based on consumer needs. I think that's something that we all need to um, think about and emulate that. And today we are talking about how do we entrench this and how do we make it uh, a part of the, net, the pipeline, the intergenerational pipeline. That's why the Michael and Cecilia Ibu University is carrying out this, uh, having this um, uh, webinar today. No, but having said that, let me come back to the issue, some of the issues you raised. You see, if you look at our national income, uh, GDP, it's about $420 billion. Of this $420 billion, only about 89 or $90 billion is investment. Government expenditure is something lower than that. But the biggest item is consumption. And there's also what we call net exports. But what makes economies grow are investments. And as long as those investments right now is about 15% of GDP, until you get to about 30, 40, 50%, in other words, until we can move that $88 billion to about almost $200 billion, then you will have the multiplier effect, which creates jobs. Not jobs for the sake of growth, but jobs that are employ people because you have a population growth rate of about 3.6, and you have uh, GDP growth rate of about now minus 6.1, but before then we we're growing at about 2%. So there, there has to be a conscious effort of attracting investments, and that's, I'm happy that Muda is here as well. So and the investments we are talking about, the entrepreneurship, the innovation and all of that, is not just at the big ticket items, but at the small and medium scale enterprises. Now, when you look at about almost 10.5 million Nigerians are involved in wholesale and retail trade, adding very limited value, but they're just selling and buying as it were. But those are critical. You, you, you talked about that. But if those guys do not have power, the artisans, the vulcanizers, the uh, guys who have their salons, the guys who are bricklayers and uh, uh, 
the guys who mill pepper and all of that. Without power, they're in trouble. But they cannot get power except the power revolution and reform takes place. That reform is what we're talking about, the cost reflective tariffs. However, there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding of cost reflective tariffs. The truth is that today, if in my office, we spend about 25, if we use generator alone, it will cost us 25,000 naira a day of 100 kVA. But when we use NEPA, or when we use uh, NERC, even at today's increased rate, we're paying 8,000. The difference between public power and, uh, and alternative power is as much as almost 16,000 naira a day for us. So it doesn't make sense for us to pay 8,000 naira a day and save ourselves about 16,000 naira? Yes, it does. Because it's cheaper in the, end, in the final analysis. And I'm saying the new tariff has something like for the people at the bottom of the pyramid, they are not paying any increase at all. So it is the, the, the affluent that will be subsidizing that. And um, whilst the tariff increase is to make sure that the private sector, the distributors, have enough money to buy their meters, buy their transformers and all of that. Right now, we don't, we're not getting anywhere. And it's, it's important that we see it in the context that if you do nothing, you're guaranteed to fail. If you do something, you might succeed. And nobody says that will succeed, but the economy is in a tank right now, minus 6%, it will probably go lower, but we need to recover. And like almost all the economies in the world, we need to recover. And recovery is going to be by leadership, leadership, entrepreneurship, innovation, and more than anything else, uh, courage. The type of courage that Chief Michael Ibru and people of his generation had, and the type of leadership and courage that has made Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs, and uh, the kind of people that uh, Peter Bankole is talking about. I think that's one. But another thing is that if you must invest, investment, the return on investment must be higher than the rate of inflation. We cannot have a situation where we have inflation of 13% and interest rates are about 1.3, 1.4, 1.5%. What you will have is a negative rate of savings. People are going to be, there'll be capital flight. And I think those are some of the things that the Economic Advisory Council and the Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance and everybody are going to be looking at. How do we make those strategic changes that will address this uh, the, 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 the basis of investment in the country. Because without investment, private sector, small scale investment, we are going nowhere. And I think that's what the, some of the measures have been taken today, i.e. cost effective tariffs, i.e. align investment coming to the refining sector, and uh, luckily GT Coloco and other that I have, the fertilizer, the petrochemical sector, and then more than anything else, adjusting to make sure that there, there's financial stability in the system. I think these are, there's no, we can't hide away from it. So I'm trying to close very quickly. The COVID is not an excuse for doing the wrong thing. COVID, we had, Nigeria as a country had pre-existing conditions before COVID. So we, are, we should use the opportunity of COVID to address the pre-existing conditions we had together with the current problems that we have. And then we need to address that. And I'm sure, I'm confident and hopeful uh, optimistic that by this time next year, uh, things will be looking better because we have, we've taken some of the uh, bitter steps that we need to take. And if we fail to take them and hope that the price of oil will come back to $80 a barrel or $90 a barrel, and then we can stay the way we are, obviously we're not going to get anywhere. But I'm just being brutally frank and honest with everybody here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Bismarck Rwani, for that uh, very uh, wonderful insight uh, in terms of some of the key uh, risk and uh, the fact that COVID is not an excuse. Uh, entrepreneurs must have audacity, like uh, the late Olorogo Michael Ibru had, uh, to take on risk and also uh, to have the necessary uh, frameworks in place to be able to mitigate some of the exposures. Uh, we just pulled uh, uh, what the challenges faced by entrepreneurs today are, uh, and I'd like to share you the results, and this would help us with the panel conversation. As you can see from the results, which I'm sharing on your screen, uh, number one is the lack of infrastructure, followed by the lack of funding, 
Uh, and then in that order, we have uh, knowledge gap of the entrepreneurs, and then weak government institutions, and then followed by unsustainable business plans. And lastly, we have key man risk. So I'm going to bring on Muda Yusuf, who is the president of uh, the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, and I'd like him to address the issues of infrastructure uh, and um, also lack of funding uh, as we think of the challenges entrepreneurs face today uh, in Nigeria and also in Lagos. Muda Yusuf, over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it's a privilege and a honor to be here. And let me first also commend <clears throat> the Michael and Cecilia, Cecilia Foundation for putting this event together. Uh, just as this, this Mark said, uh, the rescue of the Nigerian economy lies to a large extent on the progress made in the private sector. And the key drivers in the private sector are the entrepreneurs. Just to illustrate, the federal government budget proposed for 2021 is 11.86 trillion. This is just about 8% of our GDP. So how much impact can that have? That's just to illustrate that if we want to move the needle, if we want to transform this economy, we need to do a lot uh, in the direction of the private sector. And private sector development is critically dependent on competitiveness and productivity. Of course, you made mention of the infrastructure. Infrastructure is key to competitiveness and productivity. And innovation, which is relating to the theme of our discussion, is a major driver of these two crucial variables. I'm talking about competitiveness. I'm talking about productivity. Happily, the country is blessed with the best crop of entrepreneurs that anyone can find anywhere in the world. Uh, one of them is the man we are celebrating today. But the quality of the investment environment is what we make the whole difference. Mr. Bankoli has shared an excellent conceptual insight on the key dimensions of innovation in business and the impact on business and economy. He reference the product innovation, process innovation, and business model. But what is important, uh, what, what I like to do is to expand the scope of innovation. It is good to look at the micro level impact of innovation. But it's also important to look at the macro level impact so that we expand the discussion to look at innovation generally and how innovation can bring a lot of transformation and impact to the economy generally, not just at the commercial level, but also at the economic development level. And government support is very critical, especially in providing an appropriate policy context. If we don't have the right kind of policy environment, it will be difficult to drive innovation to the level that we are seeing in other clients. I will highlight some very quickly some important uh, innovation policies that we need to pursue. First, we need to pursue policies along the lines of commercialization of academic research. And that means that the value proposition of research and innovation initiatives must also be very sound. It's not enough to have academic research that is not based on any, any demand research or that is not derived from the needs of the market. So the commercial value pro proposition of any research is very, very key. There's also a need for the government to play, to give a much greater support for research and development initiatives. Nigeria's expenditure on R&D, which is research and development, is possibly less than 0.5% of our GDP. Now, I must say this is the story in most of the African countries, but we need to do a lot more than that. In the countries that we today regard as advanced economies, they invest heavily, I'm talking about the government, invest heavily in research and development in order to support the transformation of the economy, in order to support private sector development. 
Then we also need to address the issue of technology transfer to facilitate adoption and adaptation of new technology. Innovation is not only just about creating new things. It's also about adaptation of technology that have been created elsewhere. So we should be looking at that in order to also boost the impact of innovation on, uh, on the economy and on private business. There's also a need to create effective collaboration between science and industry. In order to know what industry needs, what the economy needs, those who are in research, those who are promoting innovation must relate regularly with industry. And there must be a framework, there must be a policy framework within the academia to be able to make this happen. So that there's a proper exchange of ideas, of views, of understanding of perspectives between industry and science. That is very key. We also should be looking at how we can create clusters, cluster policies, technology parks, technology platforms. These are very important initiatives that can promote innovation. We should also be looking at how we can reduce the risk of innovation. Because if you are going into a new area, you want to discover new products, it's, it's a very risky thing. You can succeed, you may not succeed, and you may lose a lot of money. But if you have a framework that allows risk sharing, that reduces the risk of taking on some of initial initiatives, that should also be a great thing to do. We should also be looking at tax incentives for private sector firms that are looking at investing in IP. That will encourage more private sector firms to be able to invest more in research and development. If you have a very robust tax incentive scheme. That will also enable the private sector to support the center that we are launching, launching today, if you have that kind of tax incentives around it. Then there's technology matching services. We should have a framework where we can match technology with industry. That is looking at what technologies are available and what interests uh, the, the industries are showing. And we should have a platform who we can match both the technology that is created and the technology that is needed in industry. Then we need to align innovation with the gaps in the economy. Uh, we need to identify our priority area as economic development is concerned. So the context must be right, we must understand the market, and we should innovate in a way that we, not, we are not innovating in a vacuum. A recent research that was done in some developing countries laid a lot of emphasis of innovation on things like ICT, energy, environment, agriculture, healthcare, digital services, and manufacturing. And I'm sure this also applies to a larger extent, even to our country. So when we are focusing on innovation, we should broaden the scope and look at areas of our economy that we want to also develop, that we want to also accelerate and deepen their growth and development. So innovation as a policy at the point level will be focused on this, on this area. And we should also have the institutional environment that supports innovation. We should have quality ICT infrastructure. Uh, the moderator mentioned issues of infrastructure. ICT infrastructure is very, very critical to innovation. If we don't have that, it slows down the whole process of innovation. All the innov innovative ideas that uh, Bankoli and there too. Most of them are on the back of, of ICT. So if you have a strong ICT infrastructure, and I'm sure a lot will happen, even much more than much more than we have today. Then we cannot build something on nothing. We should invest in basic, secondary, and tertiary education and skills for building innovation capacity in any country. That should happen in Nigeria. India, for example, succeeded in ICT-enabled exports because of the large pool of educated and trained employees. If you have a large bunch of illiterates, people who are out of school and all of that, how are you going to bring them on board as far as innovation capacity is concerned? So innovation, schools, education is very, very critical, you know, at the macro level, on top of which you can now build, you know, bigger, and innovation capacity. We should support EGL investors, venture capitalists, who often take the support to new ideas. We 
It will give them tax incentives and all of that. And government also has a role in reducing technical risk, commercial risk, and financial risk for those who are, are taking uh, taking steps in the area of innovation, funding R and D, funding demonstration programs. You have a product, you want to try it out. There must be a way that government can support the demonstration of such a of, of such program. Then there should be potent, patent policies and other intellectual property protection issues. If you talk to people in the creative industry today, one of their greatest challenges is the weak intellectual property protection that we have. If you come up with any new ideas today, before you know it, it is all over the place. There is no reward for your intellectual property, no patenting, if there is a patenting, there's even no enforcement capacity. So all of these things are very critical, you know, to ensure that uh, we track and find the frontiers of innovation. So let me stop there because of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf. Dr. Muda Yusuf is the Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, and he's said a number of things that would help, uh, especially around the challenges uh, faced by entrepreneurs. At this point, I'd like to call on the, own, uh, the one of the female panelists, uh, Olayemi Ayanechi, the managing partner of uh, a consulting company called Seftin Frost. Seth and Frost, um, let me, I'd like you to speak to us around uh, the issue of business plan on sustainable business plan and key man risk being part of the challenges faced by entrepreneurs today in Nigeria. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Doctor. Uh, once again, let me thank um, Michael and Cecilia Ebru Foundation for this invitation. Um, I'm really honored to be here. So when you talk about um, weak business plans and key man risk, let me first take key man risk. So you find that, um, like everybody has said today, Nigerians are very highly entrepreneurial. So when you have organizations, especially the smaller ones, and let me just correct, I run a law firm. Uh, so yes, yeah, a consulting firm, but I run a law firm. So that, that, that's what I do. So I'll take it slightly from that perspective. When you talk most especially about SMEs, small organizations, key man risk is a major issue to entrepreneurship because it's difficult to have a succession plan that then builds people up. The average Nigerian wants to go and do his own business. You know, they want to, uh, we are very entrepreneurial. He wants to go and do his own business. And you know, uh, when you want to develop something, you want to have a business that has a plan to grow. We've all mentioned Microsoft here today. Microsoft was started by one person. And look how, how big it is today. It's very difficult for the Nigerian entrepreneur to actually develop that kind of business from scratch. And one of the reasons we have that, um, somebody also mentioned that it's a legal system. So there's nothing to protect your IP. There's nothing to protect your uh, trademark. There's nothing to protect your ideas. You are running a business and somebody is busy uh, doing it on the side. Uh, I, 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 I had a client, the person ran, um, she ran um, an optician, opti, op, opti, op, optician uh, company. And one of our clients had come and taken her staff away by the side to run the same business. Now, when that failed, she came to complain to the owner of the company. The guy said, well, you bring this to me. You did it on the side with my staff. So you see that for small businesses, they run a lot of that risk. You then find that they are the only one running their businesses. They don't have the support. They don't have the uh, they don't have the stable platform to actually build a business. And when you when you want to go and when you want to move up, I mean, as a law firm, for instance, people will typically say, "Oh, how many partners do you have? How many senior associates do you have?" They are looking at a situation whereby there are many people on the top that can actually share that management risk. But for small entrepreneurs in Nigeria, it's a bit difficult because the system really doesn't, um, doesn't support you developing something without people trying to uh, kind of uh, reduce from it and take away from it. So for me, I think that's, like, that's how key man risk is a major issue for entrepreneurship in Nigeria. When you talk about sound business plan, so um, a lot of us are emotional investors. So for instance, you hear that, oh, this thing has been making money. This thing is working. 
we need to realize that to do a business, you must have a plan. And I always advise people that come to me that, oh, we want to do this. The first thing I ask them is, have you done your feasibility study? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the barriers to entry of this business you're starting? So you find a lot of people rush into ideas. They haven't sat down to think about, okay, what am I doing? What would I face? What are the challenges? And how do I overcome the storm? Okay, even talk about funding. How much do I need in the short term? How much do I need in the long term? How do I plan from scaling from where I am today? And if you do not decide all that from where you're starting and you want to decide it along the way, you run the risk that, you know what, you don't have something sustainable. You built a business that halfway through the way looking for funding, you're looking for financing. So um, we, we, a lot of us don't have the business plan, maybe because of funding. Because for instance, if you want to go and develop a business plan, you probably need to go and pay a financial advisor who then wants to take some money. But I always then advise clients as well that, you know what, sometimes it's better you to have 10% of a hundred and hundred percent of nothing. So can you afford the, do you have the wherewithal to do the kind of uh, due diligence, the kind of feasibility study that you need to do today? Do you have the means to bring people at senior level to assist you in chart plan for the company? Okay, if you do not have that means, uh, has it occurred to you, look for the people that can offer you this service and offer them some equity in your business? What's the point of 100% that can't get you anywhere? Um, I was quite impressed that a young man came to me recently. Uh, he was just 24, the same age that um, Olorogu Michael Libri is when he left, and he was in his company. And he then wanted to set up a business. So he says, you know what, Mrs. Ayanichi, I, I don't think I have the, I don't think I have all the skills to do what I need. Um, are you, are you, are you able to help me? I don't mind giving you some equity in the business. I've also gone, he mentioned the name of a few people. I was quite impressed because I could see that this was a guy that knows that, you know what, I have this idea, but I don't know how to see through, I need help. And, you know, people need to be a bit more resourceful when, when thinking about that. Get a good business plan, get people on board that can help you so it's not just you because really, even when you talk about private equity financiers, when you talk about investors, and I keep telling that as well. You know, people don't really finance projects as much. They finance people. So no matter how wonderful your idea is, when the people, I mean, let's talk about PE, for instance. They look at your project. They look at it. It's fantastic. But they look at your management team. I've seen companies that could never raise money because they just lacked a study. They lacked a good management structure. So key man risk is a major issue because to raise the kind of funding you need, Investors want to look at your management. They want to be sure that, you know what, if you're not there, there's somebody else that's carrying it on, there's somebody else that's pulling the weight. And when you, when you put those two things together, it, it, it is really an issue in developing businesses. It's an issue in, um, in, 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 in birthing ideas. And, and that's why I think those are the two things that if Nigerians can, uh, especially SMEs, if they can have, um, if they can have support, right? where they can go, and I know, um, I mean, institutes like trade and commerce are there, they can have support where they can go, they can get resources to help them set up their businesses, resources to help them develop the, the good business plan, and resources to give them support from the human capital perspective. I believe that would actually enhance how businesses grow and, um, and entrepreneurship on a general scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very distinguished Alayemi Ayani Chi, uh, managing partner of uh, the law firm. Uh, I'm happy that you corrected uh, us to say that you are the managing partner of Seftin Cross, but I think you did justice to the question. I I'd like to bring in um, Obaru Osa. I'd like you to unmute your mic. Obaru Osa is the regional executive for the Bank of Industry, uh, the Southeast, and he focuses more of uh, in the SME space. Um, and one of the key things which came out from the pool is the lack of funding capital. And I know that in your presentation to Ross, you talked about uh, the factors of production. Uh, and we all remember the factors of production, labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship. Now, Capital has fixed and working capital, which includes machinery and interest and so on and so forth. And then listening to uh, the poll the, from the audience, 
the issue of capital is, an, uh, is, a, is a challenge. And the Bank of Industry is, a, is an intervention bank, which was created both by a combination of the private and public sector to bridge the gap in terms of capital. So I'd like you to address uh, the capital challenge and uh, what companies or entrepreneurs who are here listening can do uh, to assess funds from Bank of Industry, also from uh, other finan um, uh, financial uh, development institutions like your organization. Thank you. Abaru. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so let me just uh, follow the normal protocol by commending the organizers uh, to celebrate a trailblazer, uh, someone who has the power of execution, uh, someone who has the Midas touch and a generous uh, giver, uh, the late Olorogo Michael uh, Ibru. Uh, specific to your question, uh, entrepreneurship uh, involved extraction of value, you know, extraction of value to satisfy societal needs. Uh, so when the key speaker was talking, uh, all the ingredients of entrepreneurship you read in business school, they are part of Olorugu Makaribri profile. Because he spoke about financial opportunities, he spoke about taking risk, he spoke about self-confidence, he spoke about motivation, focus, etc. So for me, Olorugu is a clear example of somebody that should be celebrated in any business school or business environment. He has an emergency, he thinks out of the box, he embraces new ideas, he's a goal setter, he's a goal getter. He's multitask, multi skilled. He never took no for an answer. So he continued to push the front house of the development. Now, specific to your question, there are several challenges within the MSME space. Several, the whole multitude. Finance is just one of them. Finance is just one of them. Unfortunately, in our environment, in our client, everybody seems to focus more on finance as the problem of developing MSMEs or developing the country. But I dare to say, because I'm involved in this business, I would say that I agree it's a challenge, but it's not the main challenge. There are challenges. So I would love to talk a little bit more about other challenges in MSME space. The first challenge I see is an idea stage. Not every idea is bankable. Not every idea will make profit. However, any idea you have, you need to subject that idea to a business case. What I would call the business model. Some people call it the business model canvas. Now, there are nine bidding blocks of that business model canvas, which every idea should be subjected to. If you look at the key presenter in talking about what Olorugu Magribra has done, each idea he tried to deal with, first, he went to look for partners. Two, he identified what product am I going to make or what service am I going to render? Who is going to buy that product? Who is going to buy that service? At what price am I going to sell it? Who are competitors in the market space? So what are my key activities in the process of this business? Three, what value am I putting on the table? Value proposition. You can have an idea that doesn't have value, people will not buy it. You can have a service idea that value, people will not pay for it. So not all ideas will result into business. That is why I'm also happy with the key present when he said, if you start an idea, a traditional process, it doesn't work, you drop it. You try another one. It doesn't work, you drop it. But these ideas must be subjected to time-tested principles. The principle of partnership, the principle of key activities, the principle of value proposition, relationship management, customer segment. Who is going to buy what you want to sell? If you don't have a customer, you can never sell. We fund businesses. You go to you inspect the factory. You see a whole lot of unsold stock, build up unsold stocks. Nobody's buying. Yes, they produced. Yes, they are a product, but there's no market because financing involves you running through the circle from the process to funding, to process, to the manufacturing, to the sales of product, to sales and the revenue. If you don't complete that circle, you cannot generate resources to repay the banker. 
And so the banker is interested. Beyond giving you the money, he's going to ask a series of questions. He's going to ask for information. He's going to ask you, for instance, can I have your business case? For instance, can I have your business plan? For instance, can I look at your manager profile? For instance, who are your competitors? What service are you looking at? Where are you going to locate your factory? Is your factory a raw material-based industry, i.e., the raw material will come from the environment, or we are going to import, in which case, whatever happens to the dollar affects your business. These are questions that the banker will ask you. What I've seen from my experience is that people do not want to subject themselves to some of these questions. All they say, give me money, give me money, give me money. It doesn't work that way. The money is available. I can tell you shortly that all the banks in Nigeria have pool of funds. The SI is actually support businesses. But why come they are placing a lot of funds in treasury bills and other government, uh, government instruments without actually giving our facility? Is it because the SMEs, even the large corporates, we are not ready to submit ourselves to a process. So the business model process is one of the challenges in banks, in banks giving money to entrepreneurs or people who are seeking funding. So the more people who can embrace this process, the better for us as a, a country. Two, the feasibility study should show clearly the product and the timing. And of course, don't forget, funding can come from different options. You can have your own equity, equity funding. You can also go for debt. Now, most cases, people focus more on debt to say, I want money from bank, I want it from bank, the bank is not giving money, the conditions are too, are too, are too many. If there are no conditions for banking, the banking will collapse in less than six months. Because there are requirements, first of all, when you look at your business case, how much do you have in the business? So you want to say business holds 100 million. I can have one equity, 30%, 30 million. I cannot come to the bank and I tell the banker, I have a business I want to do. The entire project costs 100 million, but I have more 30 million, which I want to do the business. But then you say that, the man is more relaxed. You say you are committed to what you want to do. You are committed to what you want to do. You can also say, I raised money from my friends. I raised money from my savings when I was working. Or I raised money from my previous other investments. The guy is more relaxed to talk to you when you make such comments. Then, having agreed to support you, there are requirements that must be made. We need to look at your management. We need to look at your business case. We need to look at the idea you have. We need to look at the market. We need to look at the competitions. Who are those in the same similar kind of business as you are in now? We also look at the product and, of course, technology applicable to the business. So it is not just funding. People say everything about funding. People, people, don't, people forget about talking about the environment where the business operates. People forget to talk about the risky businesses. People talk about uh, the, 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 the risk in the environment and the opportunities in the environment that other people are harnessing. So for me, really, it goes beyond funding. Funding is given. We are ready as an institution to provide funding. There are a lot of funding available. Microfinance banks, commercial banks, the DFIs. The DFIs, there are about six or seven in Nigeria. They are set up to address specific areas of the economy. For instance, the Bank of Agriculture was set up to give financing to agricultural services. BOI was set up to support industries. Nexin Bank was set up to support people into export and import transactions. All these banks have a pool of funds waiting. Internally, as BOI, we have developed specific products on agro-processing, on, on sand and clay business, hospitality, on quick sale restaurants, on fintech, on the emerging industries, where people, people do movies and all that. We have product designed. We have an agro mechanization product paper designed. But you know what? It is only those who have been able to subject themselves to a business case who step forward to assess the facilities. Thank you. And so when you look at the map of funding, most of our facilities are tilted to, to, to West Coast and Southwest. Not more in the Southeast, not more in the South South, a very few in North Central, the majority maybe again in Northwest. Why? Those people in the Southwest, they clearly try to follow process and procedures. They take your requirements, they take your, what you need, and they go back and look at it. They use consultants. They pay for those services. And so they come up with a plan. And that plan is bankable. We can never write funding. So for me, really, funding is a challenge. 
but I can tell you we have pool of funds unutilized across all our products in the bank. And so the challenge for me is more of knowledge, more of knowledge and planning, knowledge as to what you want to do, knowledge as to put together your idea, knowledge as to establish a very strong business case, knowledge as to understand com competition, knowledge as to understand even the business you want to do, skills acquisition. When the ship, she, she, she presenter was talking about Margaret Ibro, he said he did retention. How many of our people today will ready to do Johnny Ma and learn the tricks of the game? In the East, where I operate, that is a model that I've sold in a way in Onisha. People are 17, 18. They leave their family house to, to, to start entrepreneurship. They go and live for 10 years serving somebody. That same period, they display character, they display integrity, they understand what to do, they learn the skills, they build the market space, they have the contact. Then when they are launching out, they are launching out with a whole base of knowledge, technical skills, market skills, ability to, to sell a product, communication skills before they, they venture out. And that is what some of us, we do not have. And I think setting up an entrepreneurial center in Delta should focus on this knowledge. Knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, knowledge acquisition. It's Thank knowledge you. that will make a difference. The whole lot of things that are available in the world, not only in Nigeria. Crowdfunding, for instance, is a big deal now in America. If you have a strong idea, you can set up a crowdfunding scheme that will generate millions of dollars within less than two, three months. People will put you $10,000, $1, $20, $100. You generate whole shit of some, some money. The idea sells the product. The idea must be strong, it must be time tested, it must be current enough, it must have all the, all the uh, uh, characteristics of a strong business case. Once you have the idea, you are good to go. Thank Knowledge you. again, because not everybody understands the requirements for seeking funding from financial institutions. People go to my financial to borrow at 3% flat. For me, it's too high. People form cooperatives, they borrow from cooperatives, 10% flat. For me, it's too high. Others go to a commercial bank to borrow at 27, 20%. For me, it's too high. But if you come to DFIs, for instance, BOI, we borrow equipment funding, 10% per annum. I'll give you five years to repay. It can be cheaper than that. We also give one capital, and we'll give you three years at 12.5, 20% per annum to repay. The same thing is applicable if you go to Bank of Agriculture or if you go to Nexin Bank. But how many people knock those doors? We have an office in Asaba, and I call that office every other week. How far? How is business coming up in Delta? We are not getting people knock the doors to ask questions. To ask questions. What are your requirements? And you now go back and review it and launch out. So funding is a challenge, but I think how to get funding is more of a challenge. The pathway. We need to learn and teach our people the pathway. Okay. Once all of us are on the pathway, then the huge funding reserves available for all product areas will be made available to our people. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Thank you very much, Obaru Osa, uh, Regional Manager of the Southeast Bank of Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have joined us, welcome to the fourth memorial lecture uh, in the honor of the very distinguished Olorogon Dr. Michael Christopher Ibru. We have with us a uh, very distinguished panelist, as you already know. Uh, for the benefit of that, of those of you joining us, we do have with us uh, the very distinguished Mr. Bismarck Rewane, the MD CEO of the Financial Derivatives Company Limited. We have uh, Mrs. Olayemi Ayanechi, managing partner Septin Frost, a legal firm. Dr. Musa Yusuf is the Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The man that you just listened to is Mr. Obaru Osa, Regional Manager of the Bank of Industry South, uh, Southeast. Obaru Osa is also uh, Urubo-centric uh, and a one-time president of, the, of one of the Robo clubs called Atamu Social Club of Nigeria. He's also in the Robo Renaissance Society, very passionate and willing to uh, provide access to capital, which is a challenge to entrepreneurs. We also have Professor Ibi Inka Fuakbe, uh, the current Vice Chancellor of the Michael and Cecilia Ibri University. And 
last but not least, we have uh, Professor Anthony Kila uh, of the Center for Inter International Advanced uh, and Professional Studies. I'm going to call on Professor Ebi Nkafu Akbe to speak to us about uh, the whole concept of uh, the EIC, uh, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, and uh, what the MCIU is doing, uh, given that she is one of the hosts of this program. Professor Ebi Nka, your mic is unmuted. Please uh, speak to us. Thank you. Okay. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead. Right. Standing on existing protocol, I'm happy to be here. Robodo. Hey. <laughs> yeah, before I talk briefly on the Center for Entrepreneurship, I want to share some statistics with us. And I'm, I know that many of us are familiar with these statistics. Uh, from the Bureau of Statistics, June 2018, um, from a list of 11 African countries, Nigeria tops the list with about 86.9 million people living in extreme poverty. And from 20, we are told that we have, Nigeria has unemployment rate of 27.1%, out of which over 21 million Nigerians remain unemployed and 13.9 million youth are part of these um, 21 million, meaning that about 41.3% of Nigerian youth are unemployed. Some of them are educated yet unemployed. But the way out we know is, try, is building innovative entrepreneurs. And this is one of the reasons why the Michael at Lebu University is thinking of setting up a center for innovation and entrepreneurship. Not too long ago, the National Universities Commission, that's the body that regulates universities in Nigeria, made it compulsory for all universities to run entrepreneurial courses. But the question is, is innovation being addressed in the entrepreneurial courses currently being run in our universities? Are universities getting it right? But one can say that a few are getting it right. An athletic university, for example, and a few others are getting it right. But majority are not. But we at Michael and Cecilia Ebro University want to emulate those who are getting it right so that we can get it right. More so that the founder and the co-founder of the university were successful business people. So we should follow in their stride. Um, our entrepreneurship program, we hope, will address innovation, design, intellectual property, and so many others. Um, we intend to build creative and innovative abilities from our students. And we hope that before our students graduate, they will be able to run businesses on their own, even register some um, businesses. We hope to build an ecosystem that is entrepreneurially friendly, and the courses will have a practical approach. We're going to bring in faculty, I mean facilitators, who are practicing entrepreneurs, who know what it takes to start businesses. They know how to manage, how to scale businesses, how to raise funds, we have heard a lot about raising funds, raising it the right way. Uh, people who can identify problems and build solutions around it. So our entrepreneurial 
courses will be innovative in nature, like I said, it's going to be made compulsory to all our students. And we're also going to be offering courses for people outside the community. Uh, we, we know there are artisans in this country who need to be trained. So we plan to run some short-term um, certificate courses that will be useful in upgrading the skills and the abilities of this category of people. And we have a whole range of um, areas we will be going into. I don't want to go to that, but I only want to say that apart from making entrepreneurial courses compulsory, we at Michael and at Lebo University, we have um, five faculties. We have a faculty of law, we have faculty of computing, faculty of natural and applied sciences, faculty of management and social sciences, faculty of humanities and arts. For all the students in this faculty, the entrepreneurial courses will be made compulsory to them and they will um, be graded, they'll be given credit on the courses. And as much as possible, it's going to be practical oriented. And we hope that by the time our students will be graduating, they will be ready. They will possess attitudes that attract high quality jobs for those of them who want to work for people. And for those with entrepreneurial mindset, they will be ready to run their businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, our Vice Chancellor, uh, for that wonderful remark. I'm going to bring on uh, Professor uh, Anthony Keeler. Uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute your mic and spotlight your video uh, as we talk about uh, the business model innovation. The keynote speaker talked about the business model. Uh, and he mentioned that the business model should be holistic in nature, uh, should be organizational wide, and also should have an ecosystem view uh, with rules redefined as well as a sense of transformation. I I'd like you to talk about the whole transformation of organization as we reflect of entrepreneurship. Why is there a need for organizations to transform themselves, especially considering um, the pandemic we are dealing with today? Professor Anthony Keeler, thank you. We can't hear you, Professor. Can you um, check your sound system? Prof, we can't hear you. Your network is a challenge from where I, what I can see here. We can't hear you yet, so I would ask uh, that you log in again. Let me go back to Bismarck Rewane uh, to give us uh, his final thoughts on the success factors for entrepreneurs that uh, they can deploy to achieve success in times like this. Your close remarks, Bismarck Rewane. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to share some data. Um, the world, the world book at the comic book says that in terms of countries and entrepreneurs, number one country in the world is Zambia with 39.9% of the workforce as entrepreneurs. Number two in the world is Nigeria with 39.8% uh, of the workforce, either subtle entrepreneurs or active entrepreneurs or combination of both. In other words, entrepreneurship is not what is lacking, it is the effectiveness and impactfulness of the entrepreneurial spirit and how they can use it to achieve what, they, what the, the goals that were set for themselves. So having said that entrepreneurship is important, um, but the innovation and the reward of innovation, because there are two things that drive productivity, skill and, and technology. The reward for innovation is that the market rewards you. 
if you look at our stock market, uh, the, I think 181 companies that are quoted, you will find that the stock market does not reward innovation because the, the economy itself does not reward innovation. Like one of the speakers said, the, it's intellectual property theft is a key issue. Uh, so we now need to actually begin to see how we can make our entrepreneurs, so we don't, we don't have a shortage of them, make our entrepreneurs innovative, make them capture the use of technology, the artificial intelligence, which uh, Peter Bankoli spoke about, and the algorithms uh, that are being used today uh, for this. Uh, I think that's important. Secondly, uh, like I said, if you, every uh, 1,000 increase, 1,000 megawatts increase in power could translate into about almost a 1% increase in GDP growth if well pushed towards those at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of uh, artisans, in terms of traders, in terms of entrepreneurs. So those are key elements that we have to watch. Then also the financing, somebody talked about financing gap. The financing gap is there. The, those things are important that financing gets to the real people. Because if you look at, if you look at how much of investment is being made at this level, the total investment um, from small scale enterprises, small and medium scale enterprises in this country, which have linkages and all that, is insignificant compared to the total investment that is required. The, the banking system, the top 100 customers, the top 100 customers of the banking system is responsible for almost 80% of their loans. In other words, 100 customers borrow about 80% of the total loans that are made by the banking system, which means the rest of the country are left with nothing. Uh, they, they are left in the hands of loan sharks um, and you know, all sorts of people. So we, we have to get that lending um, platform uh, organized. We need to license the PSBs and the mobile money, mo mobile banks like what they have in Kenya. Um, you know, and we also need to now begin to reward effectively the small and medium scale enterprises in terms of not subsidizing them, but reducing the constraints that they face in terms of logistics, getting their products to market and being able to supply effectively across to the users. I think this all sounds very, very uh, theoretical and abstract, but the reality is that the constraints that are, are our small and medium scale enterprise our retail um, providers are facing is quite significant. And the way the, the system is going, there's further and further consolidation at the top and more fragmentation at the bottom, which means that they're bargaining power in terms of getting credit, in terms of getting infrastructure, in terms of getting um, price, price leadership, in terms of actually extracting value from the, um, from the entire value chain is limited. So my, my closing answer is that there has to be a strategic intent to ensure that small scale businesses get their due, fair share so that they can multiply, hire people and become competitive like we've seen in India and to some extent in China. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bismarck Rwani. Mr. Bismarck Rwani is the Managing Director of Financial Derivatives uh, Company Limited. He is also a member of the Economic Advisory Council of the Federal Government uh, and also was uh, recently appointed one time as uh, the Chairman of the Technical Advisory Committee of the implementation of the National Minimum Wage. Thank you very much for your uh, thoughts and closing comments. I'd like to call on Muda Yusuf uh, to give us uh, his closing comments uh, as we navigate through uh, this program. Mr. Muda Yusuf is the Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, it has been a very insightful session. Uh, I'm very educating as well. I just want to say that uh, this economy is quite big, and we need to optimize the opportunities that are there. Uh, the current initiatives of uh, the Michael Cecilia University is one of those things that we need to do to optimize 
these opportunities. Uh, this economy is the largest in Africa. We have the largest market, the largest population. We have a very youthful population. And what this tells us is that the demand for various things across various levels are huge because it is the population that makes the market. So there are quite a lot of opportunities. For those of us in the advocacy space, we continue to pressure government to ensure that we have the right environment, the right policies, the right regulations, so that entrepreneurs can better express themselves. Because right now, entrepreneurs are facing too much frustration that if they are not very tough in their determination, many of them just pack it up and say that it is not worth it. So we have a collective responsibility to ensure that we engage the government a lot more at all levels, at the state level, at the federal level. We engage the regulatory authorities so that they don't come up with policies that unduly disrupt businesses and so on and so forth. So I want to encourage all our entrepreneurs out there not to give up. Uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, these current challenges will pass and uh, things will get much better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Director General of the Lagos State Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Dr. Muda Yusuf. He told entrepreneurs not to give up, that this whole crisis will soon pass away. Uh, Mrs. Olayemi Ayanichi, uh, can you please give us your closing remarks? Uh, you are now on the spotlights. I'd like to hear you, your closing remarks. Um, thank you very much. I think what I'll just say is to um, echo what uh, Mr. Bancone said in his, um, in his speech, and that is to listen to your customers. And um, as a lawyer, I have found that sometimes a client comes to you and what he says is his problem may not actually be the solution of the problem. So in listening as well, you must try to understand what is the need. You must find that need and try to solve it. And um, innovation is great. Um, I mean, this pandemic has taught all of us that we must innovate or we will, um, we, we will die or perish. And so innovation is good. And, um, and I think the key thing is Nigerians are very innovative. We are very savvy. We are very quick to catch up to things. Uh, look at the banking system, for instance. It's stronger than even the banking system of developed economies because we're, big, we're late comers. And when we get there, we kind of leapfrog and get ahead of it. So I, I think the key thing is to always find ways of, um, of enhancing value to your client. What does the client need? How can I help him to achieve his goals? It's instructive now that, you know, the prices of everything are falling of services. And so if you do not innovate, you then find that, that you may not even be able to afford, you know, you may not be able to deliver those services at a price in which you make any profit at all. So investing in technology, especially from the legal perspective, we have found that investing in technology, um, it helps you to meet the clients of your need faster. It makes your work faster. And you know, after a while, the technology learns what you want and you then provide those services quicker. So my advice as well is listen to your client, innovate, and actually um, carve out a budget for that innovation. I know that the times are hard and people will wonder, is it now that I'm not making much money? Is that the time I spend money on innovation? I will say yes, even though times are hard. You still need to find a budget, have a budget for innovation so you can provide those services quicker, faster, and more seamlessly. And um, one good thing I also noticed that Nigeria is also reforming its laws because some of our laws make it very, very difficult to innovate. Some of our laws make it very, very difficult to do business, you know, the way the world is doing it. Uh, there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of legal reform. And so people that are entrepreneurs, they should participate in the reform of these laws because if the draftsman does not hear your point of view, they don't know what you're going through, it's difficult them to try to draft a law that works for you. So constantly participate, engage in a lot of advocacy, either at the industry level or association level. And if we can do all that, then things will look better for Nigerians as a whole and, and the future is bright. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very distinguished Laiyami uh, Olayanichi of the Septim for Origin Partner for your wonderful uh, closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Abaro Osa, I'm spotlighting you for your closing remark. Can you tell us um, a few okay. things uh, in the less, less than 60 seconds? Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
just to say that uh, we should embrace peace because uh, investment can only strive in a peaceful environment. Uh, you know, you can imagine if Dangori Refinery was set up in an environment, 600 billion naira on that Dangori Refinery, you can imagine all the jobs that would have created in that neighborhood. So peace is very, very important. I will also say that uh, entrepreneurship education and skills should be a constant thing. Uh, and I think that nobody should give up. The young people listen to us, you should go to the website, go to the internet and read about entrepreneurship. Skills acquisitions, knowledge can never be enough. Uh, I will also want to say that uh, capital formation and funding gaps is a challenge in MSMEs, and I want to challenge anybody who needs funding to please visit the Bank of Industry website, www.boi.ng. We have arrays of products that have been approved by management, funds in place, we are looking for entrepreneurs who will come forward to take some of those funds. Lastly, I will say that uh, let us start small, but let us think big. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished Obaro Osa. I think I should start calling you Olorogun because uh, no, no. Uh, I think you are deserving of that title. No, no. He started by saying we should all be peaceful. Peace is very key to development and entrepreneurship. And also he's dropped the website, www.boi.ng. Kindly visit it. Uh, I'd like to call on the Vice Chancellor of the Mike Celia Imbru for her closing remark. Uh, as we close out on this panelist session. Vice Chancellor, you are on the spotlight right now. Can you give us your closing remarks? Can you unmute your mic? Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just want to add that MCIU intends to operate some enterprises and we hope to engage our students and um, so they have experience on how to run businesses, even on campus. And like I said, we intend to build an ecosystem that is entrepreneurially friendly. And on this note, I want to encourage people who are here to join us to launch this center so that we can have the best center, not just in the South South area of Nigeria, but in the best in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, uh, being careful work way. And a big thank you to all our panelists for doing justice to um, the session and also for the briefing. We'll take a short break and then we'll...
and gentlemen, once again, welcome to this program. We want to display the Entrepreneur Run Innovation Center, and then we're going to the launching of it. Uh, we all know that the world today has to deal with the pandemic, which has impacted all of us, and the importance of its entrepreneurship to national growth and development cannot be underestimated. Uh, today, the Michael and Cecilia Ebro Center for Innovation Tech technical and entrepreneurial development was established to effectively cultivate the minds of young graduates, young youths, and, and trainees on the part of self-reliance and financial independence. The courses offered a strategic nature uh, covering social and economic problems ravaging our nation, Nigeria. And the program is actually local content driven and structured to reflect prevalent realities in the country. It is 85% practical and 15% theoretical. Uh, from the, uh, from the um, courses offered, we have special courses around uh, the uh, co cookery and restaurant management, baking and sugar craft, as you can see from the pictures. We also have ICT, woodwork, plastic maintenance, snail farming, makeup, automobile technician, fish farming, sewing machine repairs, welding and fabrication, mixology, which includes cocktail and mocktail, and tailoring and fashion. So we'll take a very short video of the center, and after that, we're going to the luncheon. Thank you. was a video uh, which was a short clip of the center. Uh, we want to say that the quest to create economic empowerment is central to the activities of the center uh, and the center is designed to be an endowment trust fund in honor of our legend and icon, Olorogun Dr. Michael Ibru, 
uh, and the commitment is really around the belief to alleviate the sufferings of the youth and also provide opportunity for scholarship and skill acquisition of the young people all over the world. It's an endowment and it is dedicated as part of the contribution of the project for the Michael uh, and Cecilia Ebro Foundation. A board of trustees will be created for the endowment fund to meet its objective. Every donation, uh, which is from all good meaning Nigerians and all over the world, will be matched by the MCF, creating an opportunity for the less privileged. We want to say that uh, the Michael Cecilia Foundation has also contributed 100% uh, to the foundation which is already on. Uh, and every contribution you make will be matched by the foundation just to create an opportunity for young people all over the world to gain a skill and to be self-reliant. At this point, we'd like to call on Olorogu Justin Barowe, who is the managing director of Westminster College and also the chief launcher of this uh, program to give us his address uh, and also to launch um, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. Olorogu Justin Barowe, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Dr. Weru, thank you for putting up this. I thank the, the university, Michael and Cecilia Ibru University, for being able to organize. I'm so excited, elated to be here. I hope you are hearing me. Loud and clear, sir. Yo, very good, very good. <clears throat> Well, Olorogu Ibru, whom we are saying today, we had only two of them in Robo at that time, himself and Chief Salubi. And our Shakespeare, Chief Ugute, had a song for them. And that is, and the song goes. Robo Likokolio Wado, Robo Likokolio Miao, Ibru Talubio, Eo Poko Makoko Bede, Other day, Tiona, Koye, Malo, Malo, maybe a job, you go, a big boy, you will run far, a boy, you will Oh. There is a man, or oh, there was a man, hello, Michael Ibru, who came to this world. We have two people, two types of people in this world. Some are born to destroy, some are born to build. And Michael Ibru was born to build. You see, how can one man? be in fishing industry, air traveling, banking, yeah. brewery, newspaper, education, agriculture, and automobile. One man has that brain, but how was he sleeping? Did he sleep? And that is great. I went to the university the other day when Dr. Will and Dr. Tiger were given our oh, awarded PhD. And I was excited because I could be it. I went around and saw that that university is a going cosign. Correct. The land is there, the buildings are there, and the people who put it on, they they know what they know what they are doing because the growth is going to be there. So I am very happy to be called upon to be the chief launcher. 
But then, how do you call a teacher to be a seat launcher? For six months now, school fees are not paid. But then, you know the reason why they put me there? Why they made this launcher? They know the people who are going to bring millions, millions to this enterprise. Million to build up. We know them, and they will do. What I will advise the university now is to put on the <clears throat> the account, the bank account of this enterprise, so that the enterprise and innovation center can come up because it will help our people greatly. Help the mechanics, help uh, POP, house POP, decorators, uh, bricklayers, plumbers, help them. Tailoring mechanics, they will all gain from it. So this is, this is a good project and I sincerely want it to try, I really want it to go on. And I thank Dr. Mrs. Cecilia Ibru for this bright idea. And I thank the whole university for this bright idea. Of course, like I have said, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm just an ordinary teacher. I've retired years ago. I'm just teaching Westminster College. And uh, I'm going to put my widow's mite. Widow's mite. And uh, my widow's mite to open the, the donation is 2 million naira. I thank all of you. The 2 million naira, I know it's nothing, but I sincerely appeal to everyone who wants people to learn in this country? Who wants to, anyone who wants people to be stable, to be employed, but there are no, because there are no companies now to employ people. Go to Isolo Industrial Estate. They are all closed down. Industries are closed down. Banks and the Pentecostal Church. Go to Abakran. Where is Ajakuta rolling me? Where is DSC, Alaja? So there are no there, there are no companies today to employ anybody. They are not there. The ministry cannot pay. Where do people get employment? Therefore, the idea of enterprise and innovation center at Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University is great, it's laudable, and I pray everybody should contribute so that we can make it a success. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Ati Aboke, Ati Aboke, Distinguished Johnson Barone, you have done us proud. Thank you very much. Ati Aboke, can you show us uh, wherever you are, your video is on, just put your hands together for Honorable John Simbarroa for kickstarting. You can use the comment box to uh, show you applause to him. That was a very wonderful one. Yes, John Simbarroa is a teacher, but he's done the needful. We, we thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, just allow a few. Let's take a very short uh, presentation from uh, a presentation. To you can dance to our global anthem. Oh, 
Distinguished Honorable uh, John Zimbabwe, former president of Robo Social Club, chairman, board of trustees of Robo Social Club, and also managing director of the Westminster College. If you want to uh, donate towards uh, the, the projects of the late Honorable Michael Abreu, uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, please indicate uh, the co host will reach out to you. For every contribution made, the center will match it. This is not a donation to the Ebro family, but it's a contribution to empowerment of the young people all over the world. There's no restriction whether you are Urub, as long as you are Nigerian, you are African, you are anywhere you are, this project is global and it is in contribution to the great work of Olorogo Michael Ebro. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to bring on uh, the Senate President, the very distinguished Senator, OV, uh, Deputy Senate President, pardon, the very distinguished Senator Ovi Omo Agigev. He's still here for his uh, uh, goodwill message uh, towards this whole project. Distinguished Senate President, your mic is unmuted and your video is ported. Can you give Urobo and all our participants all over the world a goodwill message. We know you are proud and passionate of Urobo and also of the great icon and legend, Olorogo Michael Christopher Abreu. Over to you, sir. Unmute your mic, sir. Thank you, Benson. The pro chancellor of the Michael and Cecilia Ibro University, the vice chancellor of the university, chairman of this event, Olorogo Moses Tiger our President General of the Robo Progress Union Worldwide, the guest speaker, Professor Peter Bankole. Permit me to stand on existing protocols, ladies and gentlemen. It is with utmost pleasure that I identify with everything that the Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University stands for, including the events of today. In fact, I'm highly delighted you've considered me worthy to be missed as a special guest. I'm honored and I thank you very much. It is in German, given the present global focus on jet speed innovation and entrepreneurial endeavor, that the topic of this fourth Ulrugu Michael Ibru Memorial Lecture is Innovation in Entrepreneurship Changes the Rules of the Game. This is just as the occasion provides the opportunity to launch the timely project of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. As a nation that still carries a huge burden of economic development, we must keep innovating, particularly in areas of entrepreneurship. As we are aware, the present administration of President Muhammad Buhari is determined to pull 10 million people out of poverty in the next nine years. We will have a big stake here and should be part of it. Very instructive that the cross of your vision as university is to reduce poverty by raising well-rounded, globally competitive graduates who will be influencers, society builders in their various fields. To achieve this, we must concentrate on the youth. The more our youth are engaged in value creation through vocational skills and entrepreneurship, the further walk away from poverty as value is easily convertible to wealth. As we launch the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center on this occasion, it is most appropriate 
that you have chosen the development of vocational skills and entrepreneurial competence as your focus. It is appropriate that you have recognized innovation as, center, as central to achieving your set goals and indeed your vision. As we engage in life struggles as a people, as a nation, as a hope of Africa, and to a large extent, black race, we cannot overemphasize the role of innovation. We, as a developing nation, must have one or two things to learn from late comma countries. Please permit me to use that phrase. By this contraption, I refer to those countries whose economies grew rather exponentially at a time after the countries of Europe and North America had established themselves as developed countries. These countries are typified by Japan, China, India, Singapore, and the likes. They had adopted a double strategy of reverse engineering and essentially innovation. Through reverse engineering, they were able to copy production processes by way of technology, and they improved on them as much as possible by simplifying and making them compatible with the available and cheap local labor in such a way that technology was only complementary to labor rather than substitute labor. There's no doubt whatsoever that if we must join the rest of the developed world, which is the ultimate import of your vision, we must engage in productive technology. But there are challenges. The first, by order of importance, is the legal difficulties in reverse engineering. When Japan, China, and lastly India were treading this path, there were no stringent copyright laws but since the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, TRIPS, TRIPS agreement, particularly the amendment of 2005, all that has changed. Reverse engineering has since become rather difficult as process technologies can no longer be freely copied without infringement. The good news today, however, Article 7 of the agreement and some other relevant options provide for local adaptation of the TRIPS rules on reverse engineering. Related to this jet age syndrome, which significantly reduces the life of whatever technology that may be in vogue at any point in time, this is very unlike the situation where nations, as the Asian Tigers mentioned, were during the world of technology. The implication is that while we try to understand and master a particular process technology, that is even when we get around trips it could become obsolete, thus bringing us back to square one. This is where innovative thinking comes to play. With the new institution being launched today on this occasion, it provides the young university an opportunity to join the elite club of universities whose area of competence and emphasis is technological research as well as innovation. You could carve a niche for yourself in this direction. Your focus on entrepreneurship must transcend the usual that reinforces our economy in the direction of service industry rather than manufacturing. Why we consolidate our gains in this service industry, it is time to arise and advance in the technology-driven real sector. The field is wide and open, and you are ready and ready to make a mark. I thank you all once again for considering me worthy of this grandiose event while I wish the new center as well as to this lecture a resounding success. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. Our very distinguished uh, Deputy Senate President of the National Assembly, Olorogo Senator Uvi Omo Agege, the Obarisi of Roboland, we thank you very much for joining us despite your busy schedule we know that you are passionate about robo and you will support the entrepreneurship and innovation center thank you for your glowing tributes and your remarks god bless you sir uh, i'd like to bring in a uh, good remit from uh, the very distinguished chief of air staff air marshal sadiq abubakar who is ably represented here today uh, for his goodwill message. So 
can you please uh, unmute your mic? Go ahead, sir. Thank you so much. Um, Your Excellency, the Deputy Senate President, Distinguished Senator Mwagege, our dear mother, Chief Mrs. Cecilia Ibru, Distinguished Chairman of this occasion, Special Guests, Distinguished Speakers, Panelists, and Participants. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Air Vice Marshal Emmanuel Chuku for the benefit of those who are not around when we send our greetings earlier. I am the Director of Safety at the Nigerian Air Force Headquarters, representing the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Sedik Baba Abubakar. Unfortunately, he is unavoidably absent because of some other national assignments of higher calling. And so he has directed me to come and represent him. Uh, I know personally he would have loved to be here considering the caliber of the person we are celebrating today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. He asked me to render his apology for not being able to make it. I know very well that that is, is, a, is an issue he's very interested in. Uh, talking about entrepreneurship, he has program for empowerment of youths, both within the base and outside, that is the, base, the host communities of Air Force units. I know he would have loved to be here. So permit me to enter his goodwill message. And please, wherever I say I, that means uh, the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Sedik Baba Abubakar. Here I go. I am most delightful to send this goodwill message on behalf of officers, airmen, air women, and civilian staff of the Nigerian Air Force to felicitate with you on the occasion of the Fort Olorogu Michael Ibru Memorial Lecture, as well as to launch the Enterprise and Innovation Center. The nature of the warfare today, no doubt, has drastically changed from what it used to be. And as such, the battle space and practice of warfare has been undergoing radical and continuous changes. This is undoubtedly necessary considering the spate of insecurity across the country. The armed forces of Nigeria, therefore, has constitu constitutional uh, responsibility of dealing with such cases while preventing all forms of crimes against the nation, both offshore and uh, by responding, responding decisively to any threat that could cause destruction to lives and property of Nigerians. Upon my assumption of office as the 20th Chief of Air Staff, I saw the need for a much more robust Air Force that would be adequately prepared to tackle most of these challenges they arise. In that, I came up with a vision, which is to reposition the Nigerian Air Force into a highly professional and disciplined force through capacity building initiatives for effective, efficient, and timely employment of air power in response to Nigeria's national security imperatives. This was necessary to restructure the service as it is intrinsic to professionalism. Consequently, the Nigerian Air Force established the Special Operations Command, which was aimed at addressing the challenges of asymmetric warfare. Additionally, the Nigerian Air Force unbundled the East Wide Training Command with headquarters at Kaduna into two commands, namely the Ground Training Command with headquarters in Erugu and the Air Training Command with headquarters in Kaduna. This was to enable easy control and development of specialized and effective capacity for the service to meet up with the increasing security challenges affecting the nation. The Nigerian Air Force therefore now has field command, six field commands spread across the six geopolitical zones of the country. Also, the former logistics branch was unbundled into two branches, namely the Communication and Information Services Branch 
as well as the logistics branch, bringing the number of staff branches at the headquarters into tape. This expansion was to guarantee smooth administration, effective staff control for efficient and effective service delivery. The Nigerian Air Force also embarked on infrastructure development across all Nigerian Air Force units in the country through the execution of over 900 projects, thereby upgrading and providing additional housing, schools, hospitals, operational and recreational facilities. These efforts have led to the accommodation of over 7,500 families and are aimed at enhancing the welfare of personnel, which has in turn, ref uh, which has in turn reflected on their individual and collective output. Accordingly, several training activities, both in Nigeria and overseas, were embarked upon to improve the capacity of the officers and airmen, as well as the air women. As of today, this administration has trained and winged over 114 pilots alone in the last four years, while several others are under undergoing various flying trainings at home and abroad. It is equally noteworthy that the aircraft serviceability status across the platform has improved tremendously to about 85% as compared with what is uh, with an average of 33% recorded when it was uh, in 2015 when this, this administration took over. This improvement is as a result of intensive training and retraining of aircraft maintenance engineers and technicians in the Nigerian Air Force. All these efforts were geared towards repositioning the Nigerian Air Force to address contemporary security issues. The Nigerian Air Force has, over the last five years, developed sufficient capacity and has been involved in providing the required support in the fight against insurgency and other forms of armed banditry and criminality in the country. The Nigerian Air Force, in synergy with sister services and other security agents, will continue to work assiduously overcome these contemporary security challenges in order to ensure a peaceful and prosperous country. While congratulating you on the giant academic strides made so far in your prestigious institution of higher learning, I would like to seek your collaborative support towards improving the operational capacity of the Nigerian Air Force. This administration has identified the need to continuously develop human capacity through robust and result-oriented training, through strategic partnership with ministries departments and agencies for enhanced research and development, thereby enforcing a culture of self-reliance and prudent management of resources. In this regard, it is our hope that the Nigerian Air Force gets maximum benefit of your prestigious institution. In conclusion, I urge you not to rest on your oars, but continue to ensure that your institution remains a credible source of knowledge for the benefit of humanity. I want to thank you so much for the privilege granted me as a special guest at this occasion. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, representatives of uh, the Chief of uh, Air Staff of our great nation, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar. Uh, God bless you for your Remarks. The account number of the Michael Cecilia Ibri University is on the chat room. You may kindly take notes. And those of you who like to be private, you can use it to uh, contribute towards the entrepreneurship endowment. What we are building is an endowment fund, uh, which is for the project of uh, empowering uh, entrepreneurs all over Nigeria and all over the world towards the project of the Michael, uh, Olorogo Michael Ebro Foundation for the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. At this point, I'd like to call on uh, Professor Gordine Dara, 
uh, to unmute his mic and also uh, give us his good message. And after that, we'll take uh, uh, our big brother, uh, Mr. Onajiti Okoloko. Professor Dara, over to you. You are on right now. Thank you very much, uh, coordinator, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, a brief uh, goodwill message to the organizers of this very wonderful program. Mm -hmm. I, I, join, I join everybody in uh, congratulating the university for starting this very innovative program so early so that it can inspire other people. I, I am delighted that this has taken root here because I remember that uh, most of us growing up as young children in those days, we saw Michael Hebrew as a, an embodiment of the best that could be achieved by Europe people. I, I worked for them briefly as chairman of the editorial board of the Guardian. But when Chief Macalibru was being buried in 2016, I published an article in the Guardian, and the title I gave to it was Chief Michael Christopher Onajiri Hebrew, the Jesus of Urobo Integrity and Prosperity. Now I use those adjectives to capture some essential elements of what uh, created the epic story of the Hebrews. So I, 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 I want to concentrate on two things. I'm presenting this uh, goodwill message on behalf of Achoja Research Council of Robo. It's a think tank dealing with robo matters and providing some intellectual perspective to help those who are in investment and politics. So the, 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 the essential matter that has come out of all the discussion is that Nigeria will make progress if we make more investment. And that investment will be made by people who innovate. The environment, it is key problem. From the discussion so far from the experts, the Nigerians are naturally innovative. They are also naturally entrepreneurial. But the, the government of Nigeria does not seem to provide sufficient structural and environmental support for those who want to innovate. I leave that to the experts. But I want to return to a matter of the ethical and cultural environment of innovation. And there are two ways in which Urubo traditional folklore and culture influenced Michael Hebrew and the Hebrew dynasty. These two ways are sometimes ignored in the globalization of the discussion. One of them is the question of enterprise. I think the, the average Yoruba person, from the experience that I had growing up, epitomizes enterprise, hard work, and, and it, it is even glorified in a popular song of the Yoruba, Ubo Bome, it is the, my labor, it's my industry that yields profit. We salute it. We have a song that expresses happiness. That you cannot grow rich, you cannot prosper unless you labor. So we also have songs that celebrate identity based on honesty and integrity. <laughs> That you must always celebrate your identity. Be careful of where you come from. Don't stain the identity of your family or your community. If you cannot tell us where your father comes from and you cannot tell us where your mother comes from, then you're likely to be a bond man 
all these things help to prepare the Hebrews for the adventures and voyages of prosperity that they made. I, 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 I want to connect this idea of integrity and hard work with two areas in which Michael Hebrew and the Hebrew dynasty disagree their terms. Take the example of the oil palm, Oriye in the Rubu language. I think some of the best technologies of oil palm in the whole world are Urubo people. It is a field in which Urubo exemplified industry. It's a hard area. It demands energy, patience, perseverance, but it also required innovation. And Urubo technologies of Beropa demonstrated to the world that they were the best exploiters of the oil palm. They could, an Urubo, a Beropa, could climb the tallest oil palm up. I will be singing a song to enlighten his people as he's going up. And that's raised productivity. The Urubo did this so well that when the palm trees in Urubo land became insufficient, they went to Ikale land in those states and they established a presence there, built an industry, industrial business for 100 years. And Professor Tite study showed that that 100 years, Urubo camps for producing palm oil and kernel and derivatives were a, a thousand camps in Europa land alone. Now, I'm saying that Michael Hebrew going to the oil palm industry, now innovated on what the people had already established themselves globally. If you want to test or find out how Robo oil palm industry improved global economy, you go to Liverpool, you go to Manchester, go to Antwerp. The, those cities were built from money derived from the labor of Robo Aberopa industrialists are innovators. The second one I want to observe is fishing. We have said that Michael Hebrew started, pioneered the area of fishing, had 25 trawlers across the ocean. Fishing also is an area in which Yoruba people had established and shown their enterprise. I did it going to school. I even climbed palm trees when I was in primary four. I climbed the twin of oil palm, which is raffia palm, to bring the derivative down, to pay your school fees. That is what is missing in our system now, that people want to get rich and acquire wealth without living. It's against the philosophy of robust existence. So I want this enterprise center. I prefer the name that Olorogu uh, Johnson Barwe give to it is enterprise and innovation center. I think the entrepreneur is a little longer. It's a little longer that we are going to train mechanics, tailors, seamstress, fishermen. Let's call it a simple name, enterprise and innovation center. Fishing is a field in which we had mastery. So for now, as I commend the university, for doing this. I, I, I'm a member of council of some universities. I'm a member of council of Western US. I was a member of council of Fupe. The universities in Nigeria were not oriented in this direction. Ken and his library university are starting a new revolution in this regard, in terms of mental orientation, for people to know that it is their labor. That is a very good beginning. So I, I urge the center to do carry out a research, carry out a research and publish information, a data on Urubo enterprises. I told you now. In terms of skills, the location, and the possibility of those enterprises become the base for Urubo industrial innovation. This is the sense in which 
comment the center again. Let it grow. Let the donors come on. And in the next 10, 20 years, Europe will build a new civilization that will extend on Michael Ibru's heritage of integrity and prosperity. You know, Mama? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished Professor Godini Dara. Yeah, Godini yeah. Dara is a professor of folklore, professor of English I literature of the Delta State it's University. It's Thank you for that fantastic presentation. I'd like to bring down the very distinguished Anajite Koloko. For those of you who don't know him, Anajite Paul Okoloko is a Nigerian entrepreneur of repute, currently the group chief executive of the Lotorech Chemical Industry PLC, known as Lotorech, also the chairman of West Midwestern Oil and Gas, and the chairman of Aeroton Exploration and Production Limited. Very distinguished on Ajite. Thank you very much for joining us and God bless you. Please, okay. your good message. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Someone, I think someone is talking over there. To uh, kind of mute their mics. I want to thank, first of all, Robo Wado. Let me start hey. by that. Robo Wado. Hey. All right. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, the opportunity of being able to attend such a, uh, a very impressive and important event. Um, I stand on all protocols um, which have been observed and um, just I'm so elated uh, to participate in this program. Um, when uh, my big auntie called me and said, Jite, I want you to say some words here. And I said, look, I'll do everything that I can to make myself available today, because this is a very important uh, event for me. Um, I met uh, Chief Michael Ibru in 1992. I was still living in America at the time. And uh, I told my dad, uh, at the time that I was going to come back to Nigeria, you know, and start, you know, uh, transit from, I mean, start my transition into the business world. And my dad told me, he said, Look, well, if you're going to come back to Nigeria for any reason, and you're going to start any kind of business in Nigeria, you have to speak to Mr. Business himself. And that is Chief Michael Ibru. You must, that is your first stop. So my dad then gave me a note to see Chief Michael Libro at that time. Um, and then I came in and I went to see him. And he treated me immediately, of course, knowing my dad, being a friend of his. But more importantly, you know, he saw me and listened to what I had to say. And he told me, he said, son, I have, you have a, uh, already an entrepreneurial drive in you, I can tell, you know. And he sat me down for at least two or three hours. And all he did was just talk generally about business, about strategy, about how you integrate your life, how you employ people. And it just went on and on and on. And it was very interesting. I remember it was uh, the office right off uh, Amado Bailey at the time that I saw him. He later introduced me to his son. So interestingly, the dad introduced me to Obode. That's how I met Obode that I think both of you should get together. And, uh, and that's how we became very good friends. But again, I want to start from the start that having sat with him and having that discussion with Chief Michael Ibru, I knew I was sitting actually with the father of entrepreneurship in Nigeria. I would actually say that I actually state categorically that he created a path for modern entrepreneurship in this country. So every business, every person who's taken a risk beyond that has always taken a risk because Chief Michael Libro opened the doors for us. In the 50s, some of us were not even born, but it is just living up to those ideals and that in an environment like this, one could actually strive to become a businessman was very important for people like me in particular. 
I also think I would distinguish him from a lot of other colleagues or people that would have been his colleagues at that time. Because at that time, when he was establishing his businesses, why a lot of people, a lot of prominent Nigerians just chose to be chairman of foreign boards in Nigeria. He created boards. That's the difference. He created businesses that established boards. He created significant amount of economic activity in the country. He was one of the largest employers of people. I would think that in his time, he probably would have been, maybe after UAC, the second large, I mean, largest employer of people in the country. He created wealth. And again, like I said, significant amount of jobs. The private sector is the only way to create sustainability today in terms of job creation, in terms of wealth. It's the only way. In a developing country like Nigeria, government cannot be the biggest employer of people. It has to be the private sector. The only way wealth can trickle, I mean, can trickle down generations to come, and the only way we can have sustainability in job creation and also businesses that have the linkage effect of creating additional businesses is the private sector. We have to move away from an environment where government is seen to be the biggest creator of jobs. The government has no business being in business. It has to be the private sector. What government is supposed to do is create an enabling environment, create infrastructure that allow private sector businesses thrive from there and then be what creates wealth. So, like we say, if you look at Nigeria today, if you look at other countries today where government is the largest employer of people, all that it does is continue to have budget deficits because we have to pay employers, I mean, sorry, employ, I mean, uh, 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 pay salaries. Government is never going to be in a position to manage businesses properly. The private sector is going to be more effective, more economical, more strategic, and of course, more innovative in creating opportunities and creating wealth across the country. So the initiative today of creating an enterprise and an innovation center, we can say that that has been an initiative or a dream of Chief Michael Ibrahim himself and all his brothers who also supported that program. Because at the end of the day, you know, that's, he has been, or should I say, the master visionary that has actually allowed businesses like us or entrepreneurs like us establish ourselves with a vision of being good employer of people, creating sustainability, creating wealth, and of course, growing the economy as it should properly grow in Nigeria. So I want to be, I just want to say in, in, in closing, that I'm very happy to have been associated with Chief Michael Ibru, with the family, with everybody who have been around him. And we need to make sure that this center becomes the foundation for teaching people, young people, how to grow businesses. I have always maintained, even in my own space, let me go a little bit to the agricultural space. And I always say that if we can train young farmers how to actually farm using agricultural best practices, because today we have thousands and thousands of millions of unemployed people today. If we took young graduates coming out of school or people that don't even have jobs, and we train them and teach them agricultural best practices, how to improve yields substantially, and gave them five hectares of land each. Each of those young farmers will be capable of generating a much, I mean, enough wealth for themselves today than any entry level job in corporate Nigeria can pay them. And then they can chart their own growth strategy over time because less than half of 1% of young graduates that enter university, enter the private sector today, will actually get to the head of those corporations. So let us use this center to be able to achieve Mr. Uh, Chief Michael Ibu's dream, Ologo Michael Ibu's dream, of creating enough entrepreneurs in our, ever, uh, in our area, um, in Roboland, in Delta States, 
in Nigeria and let that become the breadbasket of wisdom, technology, innovation, and drive, entrepreneurial drive for our country, Nigeria. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you very much, very distinguished uh, Mr. Onajite Okoloko. Uh, it's great to have you here, a Nigerian entrepreneur, currently the Group Chief Executive Officer of uh, Notorious Chemicals Industry PLC, and also Chairman of Midwest Oil and Gas Limited, and Chairman of Aeroton Exploration and Broad Production Limited. Uh, GT, you are not a teacher, like uh, Oluru John Sibarwe. You are a businessman. I think it would be nice to set the tone, in addition to uh, Johnson Barrett, to make a declaration in terms of what you are given. Don't forget that the uh, center is matching uh, Naira for Naira. So I would like you to just say a few words uh, to just um, encourage this project as part of the whole entrepreneurship and innovation center. Uh, and then we will definitely reach out to all the people who would naturally pick up the momentum who are in the business world from there. So I'd like you to say what you will be donating towards the center to empower the young people who will be participating in this project. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with, uh, I'll just, as a starter, especially during this season, we will do, uh, I'll do a 5 million Naira donation. This five million from Onajite Okoloko. Thank you very much, uh, and I think that is great. Uh, and God bless you very much for your contribution. We would the account numbers for the uh, project is in the chat box. I like uh, those who are uh, supporting the admin to please get on the chat box and uh, ensure that the account number is dropped there. If you are willing to donate towards the project, please use the uh, account number from the chat box to contribute. Thank you very much once again to our very distinguished uh, uh, Goodwin messages and panelists and all those who joined us. Uh, I think we are coming to the end of today's program uh, and I think it would be nice to have uh, the keynote address from uh, our Vice Chancellor, the vote of thanks actually from our Vice Chancellor, Professor E.B. Nkafuakwe of the Michael and Cecilia Embry University uh, as we close today's program. Prof, over to you. Yeah, unmute your mic, please. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, we want to thank God for sparing our lives to see today. As we remember our founder, Olorobun Michael Ibru, we pray that his soul will continue to rest in perfect peace. We wish to express our gratitude to the Deputy Senate President, Ove Omo Ageke. Thank you for your presence and thank you for the goodwill message. We thank the chairman of this occasion, Olorobun Moses Tiger, our father. You are always with us. Thank you very much, sir. We wish to thank the Chief of Air Staff, ably represented. Thank you for coming and thank you for your kind words to us. How can we thank the president, the visitor, chancellor of Michael and Cecilia Ibru University, our own mommy, Dr. Cecilia Ibru Epar. She's the brain behind the whole event. But we, say, we still say thank you very much, Ma, for your support. Thank you for everything. We also want to thank our guest of honor, our own daddy and uncle, Chief and Mrs. Goji Ibru. Thank you for coming. Thank you for reading our founder's citation and thank you for your kind words to us. 
we want to thank our guest speaker, Mr. Peter Bankole. Thank you for the illuminating lecture. Thank you so much. We want to thank all our distinguished panelists, Mrs. Bisma Gwane, uh, Mrs. Olayemi Ayaneche, Mr. Obaro Osa, Dr. Moja Yusuf, and we also want to thank our facilitator and moderator who is one of us, Dr. Benson Weru. We wish to thank the chairman and members of MCIU Board of Trustees. We thank the chairman and members of MCIU Governing Council, both, both past and immediate members. We want to thank our father, Professor Gigi Dara, for his goodwill message. We also promise to do the research on robo investment as suggested by USA. We wish to thank Chief Jite Okoloko for his good words to us as well. We want to thank our chief launcher, Olorogun, um, Johnson Barowe. We thank you, sir, for your generous contribution. We also thank Chief Jite Okoloko for his generous contribution. Thank you and God bless you. We wish to thank all the children and family members of the Ibru. Thank you for participating at this event. We also thank all all our staff and students and the Agbara Auto community, thank you for your support. We want to thank all the members of the committee that put this event together. The committee was coordinated by Dr. Benson Nweru, and I want to thank Mrs. Osi of the Michael and Celia Foundation for all her efforts. We want to thank the IT team, all the people working behind the scenes, uh, other distinguished participants whose names have not been mentioned, we want to thank you. It's not because we didn't recognize you, we recognize you all, but we can't mention everybody's name. I see that we have participants from California, from Lincoln in the UK, from all over the country, and maybe there are even some others from other places. Thank you for your time. Thank you for starting and ending the program with us. May God bless you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Over to you, facilitator. Thank you very much, um, our Vice Chancellor, uh, very distinguished Professor Ibiinka Fuakbe. We thank you for your close remarks. I'd like to bring in our President General of the Rubo Progress Union, uh, Olorogo uh, Moses Taiga, also to launch the center because uh, I have received comments that the uh, President General needs to say a few words. So um, our President General would like you to. Uh, launch the center and also say a few words. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Benson. Your video, uh, can you start your video so we can see you, sir? My video, I'm on the video. You okay. don't see me? All right, go ahead, sir. Are you seeing me? Yes. Thank you. So thank you, my twin brother. You are know, my much more junior in age, but we were. Megbo, sir. Megbo, First, I want to say thank you to our mother, our sister, our daughter for this unique opportunity of setting up this enterprise for our distinguished uncle, brother, and father that is gone. And I want to thank everybody, particularly the committee that you set up to discuss today, particularly Peter Bankole, 
for a wonderful discussion on innovation. I'm very grateful. And this is an ongoing business. We would ensure that this center continues to grow and grow and grow. And I want to thank particularly the Deputy Senior President and Reverend Waive for coming for the dislocation and for the words they made. I want to thank Mr. Rewane for his contribution. And you in particular, I want to thank you for a wonderful job as master of ceremony. It's been a wonderful, wonderful occasion. Well, our sister, uh, if you are asking me to say how much I want to contribute, I think they will tell me, Benson, how much you want me to contribute. Then I will try to do my best. And I also want to thank Professor Gigi Dara for his wonderful speech on what Eurobos used to do, particularly on palm kernels, palm, palm wine, and plantation. It's wonderful to hear this about our people. So if you let me know the bank account of the company, of the enterprise center, I would contribute. And I know that my brother, which is according to Cecilia, he has got the three musketeers, has contributed as a teacher, two million. That would be a beginning for the rest of us to start from, to go forward. I will try my best to ensure that this center never fails. So we do contribution one and contribution two and contribution three going forward. So that is my position. I would contribute and I will contribute and I will contribute one, two, three times. Thank you. And I thank all of you for this honor given to the Robo Nation for this particular day and for this particular university, the greatest in the Robo land. I thank you all. Olorogo Dr. Moses Tiger. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. BG, President General of Robo Progress, you know, worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, Chief Goody Hebrew. Uh, I know Goody doesn't like to be called a chief, but uh, he's a thoroughbred professional. Uh, and I'd like him to also launch the center uh, of his uh, great brother from the citation. Uh, Goody, you are on. Yeah, Goody is uh, one of the three musketeers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my sister. Goody Hebrew, you're on. Can you, can you say a few words uh, and launch the center? Thank you. Yes, um, I would like to say it has been a very successful event. I am very pleased about the turnout and the spontaneous uh, response and support that the center and the university are receiving. Uh, in many fora, I have always said that the future of Nigeria is in entrepreneurship. Yes, the indeed. The government cannot lead us working alone to the promised land. It is the private sector that is going to lead us to the private sector, to the, public, to the promised land. And I was uh, happy to hear Dr. Muda Yusuf um, corroborated that. Um, I'm happy that uh, what is happening today it's a fulfillment of a, a dream that my elder brother, my late elder brother, must have dreamt about. Because he was a passionate entrepreneur. And he did it not for his own personal gain alone, but for the people around, people in the community. And I think what is happening today is going to be the beginning of a great thing to come in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I fully identify, and when my sister-in-law mentioned it to me, I told her I'm 
fully identified. I have only been involved in the creation of wealth for my background. The fact that I served tutelage under my eldest brother. And I've been in the position of the creation of wealth in my own small way. You did. So I will be, be linking up with the Central University. And I will provide all the necessary assistance that I can give. So on, on that note, I'd like to say, once again, I've been, I'm happy to be a big part of this webinar. And I thank all those who participated. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, very distinguished uh, Dr. Goody Ibru for your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, and Mamo. Uh, would all those who have uh, interest support the uh, pro project, please uh, reach out to the center and also make your donations known as we close today. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite um, Olorogun Edure Agba, the president of Robo Social Club, to give us uh, the closing prayer as we close today's ceremony. Can you go ahead, sir? Thank you very much. Hello. Hey. I'd like to be... I would like to crave the indulgence of uh, the Yoruba people to allow me to say the closing prayers because this, as you will say, as you will see, you can see, it's an international event. So it is best to say the, the closing prayers in an international language, the English language. Most patriarch that we are celebrating today, Olorogu Hebrew. Michael Hebrew was essentially an international personality. So I'll say the prayers in English. The Almighty God, Father of all creation, we thank you, we glorify your holy name. As we call you in Urobo language, we hail you as the Agbadagburu, your Biro de Rotakoru. To no blue way, all gonna you, Father, to celebrate our great Michael Hebrew today for all that he has done for Uruboland, Nigeria, and the world at large. The opportunity is a great one because it gives us an opportunity to remember that excellence entrepreneurial skills is very important to the development of our nation and our country. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate Olorogu Michael Ibru. We also pray that with this opportunity, let the Ibru family become a point of reference to all Yoruba people, all of Nigeria and the world. The establishment of the Michael and Cecilia Hebrew University is a way of ensuring that the legacies of Ologu Michael Hebrew will continue to endure. So, Lord, our Father, let this university come to stay. Make sure that this university is the best in Nigeria. Give us all the things that are necessary to make sure the university continues to exist. We thank you for all, all that you have done today for a very interesting ceremony and that this ceremony is going to go down in the annals of uh, the university's history as something that we will continue to do in the university. God, I thank you for all the people who have participated in this event and I ask that you protect them wherever they are and protect the university and let Urubo Nation become greater than it is now. Father, I thank you, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Olorogu Edore Agba, president of Robo Social Globe. 
Uh, thank you very much. We'll take the national anthem again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we call this to a wrap. Please, let's take the national anthem. Hello. Yes, we're taking the national anthem, please. Okay. Anthem, ladies and gentlemen, rendered by Kefi. you keep safe Amen. and uh, have a good one we have come to the end of the program and uh, thank you very much everyone and god bless you all thank you thank you Thank you, everyone. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God bless us. <laughs>